stuff configured here. Okay, quick question. Have people gone back through, uh, accessed this um, on YouTube to just kind of catch up with things or refresh? Okay, Basha, you have, uh, is that, is the setup is, it works? Yes. Okay. Is, it's really hard to hear. Okay. I don't know if it's just, I can hear you really well, but if someone asks a okay. question, it's hard to know what they ask. Okay, so I might do that as we go through, kind of repeat questions to make sure it gets picked up, but um, good, glad that's helping. Okay, so <clears throat> today what we're going to be doing is working through uh, some initial stuff with like Z-scores, how we use Z-scores and things like that. This is pretty basic rudimentary stuff. Um, but I think it's important just to go through, but I'm going to assume that in your introductory classes, most of you who've gone through had some exposure to this. So, um, we're going to move through pretty quickly, but if I, so you start to get a little, a little bit lost, throw up your hand or say, Hey, you can ask me a question. Uh, so don't scream through this. Okay. So, uh, what we will be doing today, my clicker will work. So goals, <clears throat> we're going to talk about transformation uh, into some standardized scores, talk about the characteristics of standard scores. And then this is where uh, the real work starts is when we're going to start talking about how we can use those standard scores to start inferring probabilities or likelihood of uh, something happening. And then what we're going to do is spend the end of this uh, set talking about interval estimates. This is going to be a big part of your life over the next semester, thinking about the precision of estimates and uh, interpretation, uh, practical interpretation of these confidence bounds. Okay, so uh, we talked last week. Have people see this, or is this kind of small? Small. Well, how's that? Better. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We talked about last time. Um, if we have mean and standard deviation, this can uh, give us some useful information about inferring the magnitude of some score observation that we've got, uh, so long as we assume something follows a, a normal distribution. Okay. Um, but that single raw score doesn't do a whole lot of telling us the rank relative magnitude or the specific probability of some value that we've observed. Okay. So it gives us some information, but uh, we're still falling short in terms of sort of maybe maximizing um, sort of our understanding of where that score falls. And so our solution is gonna be some standardized scores, okay? With our standardized scores, uh, what this is gonna do is it's gonna put everything on a common metric and it's gonna communicate information about the score, the standard deviation, and the mean, just in one single value. Also direction, whether or not it's falling above or below the mean uh, of a given distribution, okay? And these uh, standardized scores are going to be helpful for saying where individual scores rank relative to others in terms of the overall distribution. And then also when we get into uh, some mathematical properties, looking at sort of the likelihood of probability of an observation in terms of a known distribution. Okay, that's the important thing. As long as we know what the distribution looks like, we can start to bring on uh, some things about probability. So example, IQ, this is just a nice example because this is one of our assessments that probably has the most research out of anything ever. And we know that uh, from a theoretical standpoint, IQ should fall under normal distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, okay? Um, this isn't some magical property of uh, intelligence in the universe. It's just with these types of measures, they've been standardized so that they fall on these, uh, along these characteristics, okay? Um, and so what we can do, if we think about, uh, I do all the time, get the metric, but things along, falling along these uh, normal distributions. Uh, what we can do is we can start to uh, uh, generate Z-scores, okay? Z-score uh, is a score in a standardized distribution where the mean is zero, the standard deviation is one. This is what characteri characterizes a z-score. Z-scores are defined by distribution with the mean of zero, standard deviation of one. If it doesn't have a mean of zero, standard deviation of one, you're not talking about z-scores, okay? So the mean standard deviation, the defining features uh, of this uh, distribution 
and two pieces are going to uh, communicate some pretty essential information. The value, looking at a z-score, and this is going to sort of generalize over into effect sizes. When we're looking at the value of a z-score, the, the actual number, this is going to tell us the number of standard deviations from the mean that this score falls. Okay? When you see a z-score, the first thing that should come into your brain is standard deviations from the mean. Okay? Uh, we're also going to have this sign. Sign is going to indicate our position relative to the mean either above or below. So if I go at a positive z score, I have someone who's scoring above the mean of the distribution. Negative z score means someone who's uh, scoring below. Very simple, very elegant solution for communicating a great deal of information about specifically where any individual score falls within a distribution. Okay. So uh, if we're looking at this distribution here, the score of one. Right here, right? So we're talking about someone who's one standard deviation above the mean in terms of the z score. Negative 0.5, about right here. We're talking about someone who's scoring half standard deviation below the mean. 2.5, we're starting to get up here. Uh, negative one uh, down here, right? And remember that on a normal distribution like this, standard deviations from the mean starts to tell us something about the likelihood of the score, right? Um, so if I see Maybe something that is one standard deviation above the mean. How extreme is that score? Uh, not that extreme. Not that extreme. About what we would expect, right? Sort of standard deviation of one. So, on average, if I pull any randomly selected score from this distribution, I'm going to expect it on average to score about a standard deviation above the mean, right? So, what if I find something that scores uh, two and a half standard deviations below the mean? That's a little bit more. That's starting to get more extreme, right? We're talking about we write down here, that's not much of that tail in that distribution that's left over, right? So this can start to give us information pretty quickly about the relative likelihood or probability of this case occurring. So formula for uh, transforming raw scores to Z scores, pretty easy, straightforward, simple uh, algebra here. Z is equal to uh, your raw score uh, minus the mean of the distribution over the standard deviation. One thing, make sure that your X score always goes first row, always subtracting the mean from your raw score. If you switch it around, that's a non arbitrary issue because then you're going to hit negatives when things are positive, positive when things are negative. Technically, when you could do it, but you're going to flip everything around, make it hard to understand. Okay. So always you have the raw score, subtract the mean, and that's going to give you your Z score. Okay. Um, so if we go to take a look, uh, Asking corresponding z score if my uh, raw score is 12 with a distribution with a mean of uh, 10, standard deviation of 2. Question what, what would be the z score for this? I've got a score of 12, mean is 10, standard deviation is 2. Yeah. 1, right? So I've got a z score of 1. So this person who scored 12 on whatever we're assessing here, how many standard deviations above the mean are they? One standard deviation, right? They're just saying, okay, this person is one standard deviation above the mean. So they're kind of probably about average. They're about what we would expect, okay? What about uh, if I have a score of uh, eight? Oh, awesome. Let's keep, oh, let's see you, you I, well, I was just doing the math right now, yeah. but um, could it be negative one? Negative one, right? So we've got a person who's scoring one standard deviation below the mean. All right, what about 11? Take it home. Um, Negative 0.5. Negative 0.5. See, look at this. You're crushing it already. You're a Z score master, right? Um, yeah, it's pretty easy and straightforward. So we got someone who's uh, scoring a standard deviation, a half standard deviation below the mean, right? And so what this is telling us is these are all scores that are probably fairly common, right? So you were able to do that in your head pretty quickly. Uh, but what if we say get something a little more complicated uh, that doesn't exactly fall uh, on exact round numbers? So Corresponding z score if x is 17, mean is 34.6, standard deviation 8.2. That's harder to do in your head, right? But all we need to do is go through, plug it right up into there, and now we've got our answer. Okay. Um, so thinking about this type of standard uh, standardization, um, any type of standard standardization almost always going to follow this ratio format. Okay. So uh, recognizing sort of these ratios and the things that start to impact 
um, sort of these scores going to be essential as we get into T distributions, uh, uh, Z distributions, F distributions, effect sizes, and things along those lines. This ratio here, some difference over some variance component is going to be at the basics of pretty much everything that we do over the course of this semester. Okay, so just know it, recognize it, what it is, uh, and just be super comfortable with that. Questions about any of this up to this point? All right. Uh, so um, as we're going through working through problem problems in so this portion of things, and then for this second assignment that you'll have coming up. Uh, number one way to do this is to go through and graph this out, just something along these lines. Trust me, drawing pictures will make this much, much easier if you think back to the different pictures. You're not, but if you think that, it's going to be hard and you can get screwed around uh, and it's going to make your life uh, more difficult. Plotting these out, trying to figure out what proportion we're talking about is always going to be helpful. Uh, and here, just a uh, basic kind of graph, right? We've got our natural or our normal curve. We've got our mean or standard deviation here. Z scores along the bottom. And then here, what I've done is I've sort of dropped in corresponding raw scores, right? So mean is 34.6. That's going to equal Z score of zero, one standard deviation, two standard deviations, standard deviation below, standard deviation, two standard deviations below. This is going to help solidify this and see where this stuff is falling uh, on this continuum. Okay. So we'll go through and do some examples where we're working through this. Um, but uh, yeah, this is kind of, this will make your life easier if we're going through and trying to manipulate this stuff. It seems like, oh yeah, pretty straightforward until you actually start working with it. And then things can start to get a little bit tricky. Okay. So, um, all right. Other thing that we can start doing with our Z scores. What we can start doing is use a little bit of algebra and, and start to restructure this formula to start uh, solving for any specific component based on so that as long as we have sufficient uh, information in other areas, right? So if I wanted to know, if I said, what's the raw score for z equals 9.6 if the mean of my distribution is 73.6 and standard deviation 14.8? In this situation, I've got a Z, I've got a, a standard a mean, and I've got a standard deviation. I've got three pieces of information. My equation requires four. I can start flipping that around and start solving for that raw score. And we'll do these uh, uh, in some examples as we, as we move forward. We don't have to worry about this for right now. Um, but, or let's say I've got a population with a mean of 65. Uh, I've got a raw score of 59. This corresponds to a z score of two. What's my standard deviation? Right. I'm going to take the same equation, just re go through, mix it around, resolve for my standard deviation, and I can go through and answer that. Right. Um, the population with a mean or standard deviation of four, x equals 33, corresponds to z equals uh, 1.5. What's the population mean? These are not things that you'll typically have to do in applied research a lot. But what this is going to do, and the reason why I have this in here, is starting to get you comfortable with seeing an equation and saying, if I have certain information, I can backtrack and work backward and figure other stuff out. Uh, this turns into a big sort of problem solving issue. Again, oftentimes the studies that are published don't always have the information that we might need for a project that we're working on. But if they're giving mean standard deviation sufficient information, if you know how certain statistics are calculated, it's just a simple algebra problem to backward, backward, and get sort of roughly sort of maybe that component that we would have wanted, right? And so this is just a nice way to get comfortable with manipulating data uh, to get information that we want, even if it's not explicitly posted out there. So uh, our z scores are going to give us the exact location of some score within the larger distribution. Um, and then what we can do is we can start to look at uh, that score comparing to other scores, uh, no matter what the mean or standard deviation of those distributions are, are, are going to be, right? So I've got this, I've got measure X and measure Y, okay? So let's say uh, Henry's participating in a study on personality, he scores 87 on a measure of uh, 
measure of conscientiousness, and 73 on measure of extroversion. Which uh, personality trait is going to be more prominent for you? Uh, can I answer this question? Why not? I don't have to Okay. Well, just uh, so in this, right? So, like, I don't have any standard deviation. And so, someone might say, well, he's scoring higher on the conscientious than on the extroversion. Like, well, Sure, maybe, but I don't know what the distribu those distributions are like, right? Maybe the mean of the extroversion measure is 86, and the mean of the, uh, uh, or excuse me, the mean of the conscientious measure is 86, and the extroversion is 50, testing a much higher score on one relative to the other, even though we've got a, a lower score, right? What we could do if we have means and standard deviations for both of these, we can start calculating the z score and then say relative to these two. This person is scoring relatively much higher on this than that, right? The raw scores really give us no information at all. So then we can't do all the fun with those. Okay. So here, this is an example. I'll tell you a secret, I'm Claire. Claire is me. All right. Uh, interested in creating composite quality of life variable based on scores from three different measures. How might I do this? Got three different measures, all the different scales. How might I put together like to some positive composite quality of life? Okay. So what I might do is if I just add up these three uh, scores, that's going to be no good, right? Because if I've got one scale that runs from one to ten or zero to ten, and another that runs from fifty to two hundred, the one score is going to determine where you're at on the whole thing, right? But Maybe what we could do is we could convert all of these scores and is that up your Z scores or average your Z scores or something like that. Puts it all on the same metric so we can go through. And now, that's not a good way to do this. Probably if you wanted to use all three to do the variable model, but if you do something along those lines, that's several steps higher up than what we're doing here. Like if you just wanted to see rank orders of where these people were at, this could be a, a quick workaround or something like that. All right. Talking about distribution for Z scores. When we're thinking about up to this point, when we're talking about Z scores, talking about Z scores is along our normal curve, right? That nice bell shaped curve. Important to recognize that just because you create a standardized distribution does not mean that you created a nice normal curve. We tend to associate Z scores with normal curves. And in theory, if we're using them and sort of trying to uh, derive probabilities, we're assuming that the underlying population has a nice uh, uh, normal curve. But just because we've gone through and changed things over to uh, a standardized uh, format doesn't mean we've changed the distribution in any way. Okay? Um, any uh, distribution of z scores will have these properties. Uh, the z score distribution will be identical to the shape of the distribution of raw scores. Changing them to z scores doesn't do anything. The distribution is going to look the exact same. Okay, but what will happen if I go through and I take a uh, set of scores, uh, convert them all to z scores? My mean will now be zero. And my standard if you create Z scores and your mean is a zero and your standard deviation is a one, something's going wrong. Okay. This will start to come up when we get into some applied analysis when we're doing screening, looking at outliers and things like that. Okay. So maybe I go through and I create some Z scores, but I leave some people out or forget to put people back in. And if I run my uh, descriptives for my Z scores and the mean is at exactly zero, the standard devi deviation is at exactly one, I know that I've made a an error somewhere in there. Okay. So this is a by definition. These things will always be true. What we get is a standardized distribution. And this is just our uh, distribution of scores uh, standardized to have a uh, standard set, uh, standard mean, standard mean. So let's say we've got these set of scores here. Okay. Small set, right? Here are my values with my mean and my standard deviation. We go down through my first score to zero is one and a half standard deviations below the mean, or uh, negative 1.5. Six is one and a half standard deviations above the mean. Got a uh, value of 
five, standard deviation above, score one, two, uh, F standard deviation below, three, equal to the mean, has a score of zero, two, below the mean, half standard deviation, so again, we're back to uh, negative 45, right? These are all nice round numbers, so they should all map out should closely and things like that. Uh, but what we would do is if we had a bigger set, but by hand, we would have those programs to it. But this is essentially what's going on, right? We're taking the raw score for each observation on our data set and converting it over to a z-score. That z-score tells us very specific information about where that score falls relative to other uh, scores in the distribution. Questions on this? How we got here? So, if I go through and I run a histogram here of my raw scores, and then I run a histogram of my z score, the tracer, are we see any uh, similarities between these two? Yeah, they're identical, right? So, transforming something to a z score doesn't mean that you created a normal distribution. It just means we rescaled it uh, so that those values for each individual, they just have some intrinsic meaning attached to them, right? But this is an anonymous transformation that goes through and may change the shape of the distribution. When we're talking about z scores and interpreting z scores, we're often um, inferring likely a normal distribution in the larger population. But for our sample, for our data that we have a hold of that we can look, see, feel, and touch, is not changing what that what that data looks like. Okay, so all we want is that uh, in mind. All right. Um, so, we did this before, okay? Um, but important to recognize that z-scores are only one example of a standardized distribution. Um, there are an infinite number of standardized distributions, because that can set the mean standard deviation to be infinite. The things that we often see in psychology, we see a lot of z-scores, okay? And we may see t-scores, okay? T-scores are scores where we have uh, a distribution standardized, have a mean of 50. And a standard deviation of 10. Anybody use T scores or, yeah, Emily, where do, where do you see T scores usually? Um, well, like, score, score what? Freeze. The freeze. The freeze? Yeah, the assessment for. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's, that's where I've seen them a I lot. Said, like, <laughs> like, do you I use the so score briefs? I was like, like, like Underwear briefs? No, uh, like the, the, the test. distribution on quality. <laughs> the for children. Okay, okay. Oh, so a T score, right? Yeah. So you can look at that, that, that T score and sort of understand something about where this child is scored relative to a normative sample of, of children, right? Um, IQ scores, another uh, standardized scale. Here we've got a mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. Uh, also have SATs. Who, who here took an SAT? ACTs, and yeah, I took ACTs in the day, but so the same type of thing, right? We've got SATs kind of the classic. Uh, standard de uh, mean of 500, standard deviation of 100. Sometimes that, why did they do that? I don't know. There's essentially arbitrary numbers, right? It doesn't matter, but for whatever reason, they like 500, standard deviation of 100, could just as easily be five and one, right? But uh, what it does is it starts to put things on a standard metric. So when you see a score, you know automatically is this high, is this low, or is this at? How does this function? Um, if we want to go through and transform a score uh, for an alternative uh, standardization, we do this sometimes. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, first, what we would do is transform the z scores. I mean, this is one way to do it. There's other ways that you but just in terms of simplicity. Uh, if we go through transform things to a, a z-score first and then transform that z-score and new scores uh, based on the specific mean and standard deviation, easy to go through and take any distribution and sort of get uh, z-scores or move things over into some other distribution that you'd like to see. So let's say we have a set of exam scores and we want to have map on SAT scores. Okay, we want these uh, raw scores to be on a standardized scale with mean of 500 and standard deviation of 100. Okay, raw scores, as mean of 57, standard deviation of 14. What we want to do is calculate standard scores based on the uh, on the raw data. 
Again, like I said, pretty straightforward. Here's our uh, raw scores here, okay? With mean of 57, 70, addition of 14. Okay? What I can do is I can start by transforming each one of these into a Z score. Okay, so this first one, half standard deviation above the mean is a Z score of 0.5. And I want to take this uh, to a standard deviation uh, for my uh, alternative standardized, uh, standardized distribution. And that gives me a standardized score of 550. And how did I get 550 out of that? Yep. So this score is literally half a standard deviation above the mean. If I want the mean to be 500 and standard deviation to be 100, and I just add 50 to it, right? Pretty straightforward. Uh, here, I've got a score 43. I'm one standard deviation below the mean. Z score of the negative one ends up being a, 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 my alternative scale. Uh, one standard deviation below the mean is going to be 400. Right? So I got to be five standard deviation of 100. Same thing, 57, exactly on the mean, z squared of zero, it's going to be equal to 500. 71, standard deviation above the mean, z squared of one, z squared of 600. So easy to go through and start taking these scores from the raw score to a z score and then changing it over to uh, whatever. Uh, whatever distribution that I'm wanting to see, okay? And so this might happen, let's say, if you're working with food with personality measures in the past, or they've gone through and sort of uh, had a normative sample and they say, oh, hey, here's your T-score of this. Well, if I have a T-score, I don't like T's, I'm either Z, and so it's all the same thing. You know, it's basically a preference. Now, if the whole entire universe talks about scores on the brief as T scores, you probably shouldn't report them as Z's because I know it's right. Uh, I should not report uh, IQ scores, those of you who work in Terra, as uh, the mean of standard, uh, with a mean of 500, standard deviation of 100, and one else can understand that. But functionally, it's no different. It's just moving back and forth between uh, standardized. Questions about this? So we're going to be, all of our inferential statistics are basically working on the same property, right? Now, distributions are a little bit different, so depending on what metric we're using, but just wanting you to get comfortable and saying, okay, all this is, all this statistic is, is a standardized score. And I know what standardized scores are, I know how to move back and forth uh, with them, and so just kind of take all the mystical magic out of what the hell's happening with this. They're just standardized scores. That's all they are. Um, I don't know if this is off. Probably not. But, um, so how do you decide which IQ, for example, like what change the hundred percent? Okay. So, yeah, I'll just repeat so it picks it up. Question is like, how do we determine so what we want our mean standard deviation and then things like that? For the standardized score, it's completely arbitrary. It doesn't matter, just like someone somewhere probably had a reason for doing it. I mean, Z score is nice, zero, zero and one. I mean, that's a nice, easy, it's like the metric system, right? <laughs> um, SAT, that's my American system, mean of 500 standard deviation, one kind of like that. I'm not sure what the point is. There's too many zero, like you just tacked on extra zeros in there. Just, because you wanted to, I guess, right? Um, now, how did, or cognitive achievement test, how did they decide that, oh, sort of mean is 100 and sort of go through and get that? That's just a ton of, uh, of non, uh, uh, collection of non data and then go on those on trying to figure out. That's the scaling on those types of assessments. It's quite complicated and takes up a lot of work, a lot of different samples and things along those lines. But at the end of the day, what uh, it's all kind of falling on this on this thing. We say, okay, for communication purposes, this is what we want the mean to be. This is what we want the standard deviation to be uh, for ease of communication. Take our stuff and then just go through and work so that it all works out. That makes sense. Other questions? All right. So, uh, same type of thing. If I'm trying to go through and convert, some raw scores into some sort of alternative uh, standardization scheme. 
uh, something like this. It's nice and easy. Here, I've got my Z scores at the top. I've got my raw scores here. Throw my standardized scores at the bottom. This is just a nice setup if you're doing this type of work to make sure that you're not making errors, right? Because if I've got someone who's above the mean and I could uh, end up with a standardized score of 400 there, I know that that doesn't square with the way things should be. I can go back through and say, oh, whoops, I've made a mistake here. You probably need to subtract one thing from the opposite thing as opposed to doing it the other way around. Like, oh, whoops, flip that around. Now I understand what I'm talking about, what's going on. This is always, always nice. And the reason we don't put in so much work in understanding what we're doing and how it's calculated, because we always make mistakes. I make mistakes constantly all the time. And so anytime I calculate things, first thing I do is step back and say, all right, does this make sense given to what should happen? And if it doesn't, then I'm like, oh, great. I made a mistake somewhere. I have to go back through and, and figure out where that error is. So understanding what's going on, where the stuff is coming from, graphical stuff can be very, very helpful in terms of teaching. All right, so why this is all important, okay? Again, as we've been talking about, uh, standardization allows us to uh, compare position rank uh, regardless of what uh, uh, distribution looks like, right? So if I have a Z-score of one on one uh, measure of some construct, and I have a Z-score of like, six on measure of some other construct, I know that relatively speaking, the general population, I'm higher on the first construct than I am on the other one, right? Even though those scores may be not in any way comparable to one another, okay? When you start to get into uh, regression models, we'll see this with standardized coefficients. Um, uh, being able to say which one of these predictors is likely a stronger predictor of our outcome relative to the other one. Our standardized coefficients, those are nice. They're all on different metrics, so it's hard to compare. Uh, Got an apples and oranges situation. Z scores can allow us to go through and say, at least in terms of relative to the rest of the population, where do I stand on some of these different metrics? Okay. Um, other nice thing, and the thing we utilize all the time with our inferential statistics, if I've got a standardized score on a known distribution, what I can do is start to use this to improve the likelihood of probability, prob prob probability of identifying a certain score or a certain score or higher on some distribution. Okay. So here we're working with the normal curve. We can ask what the probability of randomly selecting a score greater than or equal to something. Right? If you've got a normal distribution, a normal distribution, you know that you've got a mean of this and a standard deviation. Map on the doesn't happen there. <laughs> so all lined up the way it should be, right? Uh, we could start to go through and start to infer things about uh, these scores uh, based on their position uh, um, relative to things. Okay. So, how how far did people anybody here make it through calc? Anybody do calc two? Calc two, all right. You don't need to know Calc two to, under, uh, to sort of go through and do this, but so that what's traditionally taught in Calc two, you start to get areas of the curve, right? So how we go through and calculate that derivatives and things like that. I started out as an engineering worker, just looking at the stuff and just taking Calc two the same time I was taking. Started Calc two my second semester when I was sort of making the transition over to be a psychologist. Um, but I was in a statistics course, I'm like, oh, hey, all that weird stuff I'm doing in this math class, I'm sort of, okay, this is how people are going through using it, right? So basically what we can do, if we know uh, uh, the shape of a distribution, right? What we can do is we can start to use uh, sort of points along that distribution to infer probabilities, okay? Um, proportions and probabilities, these are the same thing, right? they're interchangeable. Um, and so what we can start to do is represent probabilities as areas or uh, areas underneath a graph or a curve. So um, if we take a very, very simple example here, I say yeah, I've got a population of scores one, one, two, three, three, four, 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 five, six. Okay. And I've gone through and plotted these out right here. Um, Matt, 
if you're looking at this, what's the probability of randomly selecting a score greater than four? 20%. That's brilliant. How did you get that? Uh, there are two out of the 10 boxes. Right. So we've got two out of the 10 boxes. Two of these observations out of the total of 10 in the population are have a score of, of, of greater than four. Right. So I've got, there's only 10. Two of them are greater than 10. It's 20%. Right. Really straightforward and easy in this example. Right. What we're doing with our uh, known distributions with our statistical distributions, it's the same thing. Okay? If we're talking about a normal curve, uh, we know that a lot of natural current phenomena, a lot of the phenomena that we're interested in one study follows this natural curve, this normal curve. Okay? Uh, our normal curve is a symmetrical distribution, highest uh, frequency of, uh, of observations occurring in the middle, tapers off as we uh, get to the extremes, the mean, median, mode, in our normal curve is RLIF. It's right there in the center. Okay. And if we have something that follows that normal curve, we've got a known uh, distribution that we can start to assign certain probabilities to. Okay. Um, and what our z scores do, these, our z scores start to serve as our marking units for uh, inferring uh, different probabilities. Okay. So here, 20%, right? Because we know out of 10 observations, two of them are greater than four, 20%. Easy, straightforward, right? Um, but what we can do with our uh, normal distribution is we can start to use some of these same principles to start to infer some of what's going on with this tail. Okay. So the area underneath the curve, all of this corresponds to probabilities. Same thing here, we've got kind of a, a weirder looking curve, right? Um, but we can take these same principles, apply to this smooth theoretical curve, and start to uh, draw inferences about uh, the likelihood of obtaining some score here uh, that will be greater than 45. So I want, I'm interested, so I know I've got a mean of 34.2, standard deviation of 6.8. What I want to do is I want to know the probability or the likelihood of randomly selecting a score greater than 45 out of this distribution. It's a true continuous variable. There's an infinite number of values that could be above 45, right? So how do we go through and find exactly that specific probability when I can't count boxes, right? Luckily, someone has all gone through and already done this, right? We know that certain points of this curve area and then the curve correspond to certain probabilities. So we don't have to go through with our normal curve and go through and derive this stuff. Okay. So here we've got our normal curve, uh, z squared of 0, 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. We know that um, about 34.1% of our observations of scores are going to fall somewhere between 0 and positive 1. And because this is a symmetrical curve, how many, uh, what percentage of scores? Which will fall between uh, zero and negative one. Thirty-four point one, right? So it's the same thing. We got both things, right? When we add those two together. We can say sixty-eight point two six percent of scores are going to fall uh, within one standard deviation. We can go out to two standard deviations. Uh, if we look at tails beyond that, we see two point eight percent of the of scores in a normal distribution are going to fall above two standard deviations. Um, those are the how many are going to fall below two standard deviations. 2.28, same thing, right? So it's an exact symmetrical distribution. We can fold it in half, we're getting the same stuff, right? And because people smarter than me have already worked this out a long time ago, we don't have to go through and independently derive things. We've got, now we've got uh, the internet. <laughs> and calculators that will go through and do that very quickly and efficiently, right? But what we used to do, even when I was sort of first starting out, is you'd have table values, right? And what we can do is start getting approximations based on these table values. Um, here uh, is mathematical function for our, for our normal curve, okay? But, a distribution that doesn't 
follow that uh, that equation, what do we have? <laughs> this terrifying parallel distribution, and we don't know anything about it. It's an unexplained distribution that we can't infer anything from. It's a very scary situation. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's go through, and you know, we're thinking about sort of using this all in terms of an example here. Okay. So we say uh, population of adult heights normally distributed. With a mean of 68 inches and the standard deviation of six, given properties in the normal distribution, what's the probability of randomly selecting an individual taller than 80 inches? Um, someone taller than 68. Now, what we would probably do in this uh, situation, we go through and draw out our figure. Right? We go through the sketch. We say, all right, I know that the mean is 68 inches. Uh, six inches of their standard deviation. So one standard deviation, 74 inches, two standard deviation, 80 inches. All right. And here, or is that right? Yeah, that's right. So two standard deviations. And what I'm interested in are people who are six, eight or taller, right? So I'm looking at this tail distribution, right? So I'm going to shape that in so I don't know what I'm looking for. Then what I'm going to do is identify the exact location of that X by calculating my Z-score. I go through, calculate a Z-score uh, is equal to 2. Now, if we can do the math in our head, uh, that's slick. But if not, we know that Z is X minus mu sigma, right? And we would say we want to know 80. Minus 58 or 6. So then goes 2. So what I do is I say, okay, this point that I'm interested in corresponds to a z score of 2. Then what I can do is I can determine the probability uh, associated with that uh, using my limit normal table. Okay. Probably today, what we would end up doing is just punching two and using a calculator uh, online, which is what we will eventually do. But wanting you all to start to get familiar with at least looking at these uh, z score tables and, and, using, and using this. So until I say use the internet and some of those calculators, use double check with your calculator, right? If you're like, okay, I can base on the table, I think this is what it is, plug it into an online calculator and see. But uh, we'll, uh, to this point, we can't do it. So, our unit normal table. Uh, and these out also have one uh, posted uh, in the handout, so you have an electronic copy of this. Uh, for our Z tables, pretty slick. What we have here uh, in the far left column, these are going to be our Z values. Okay. Uh, what we've got next is uh, a probability. Or if we take a look at the uh, z score, larger portion of the distribution, okay, that's going to be here, this piece of things, right? And so, what this is going to do is it's going to tell us uh, the probability of finding a score in that sort of larger portion. We're going to have a smaller portion. This is obviously the opposite side of this. The table that you got is really slick because it also gives you uh, the probability of finding a score between a z score and the mean. And that gives you another piece of uh, information there that you can go through and, and find. So if it's looking at from zero to the z score here, um, and then this y, this is one. Don't worry about the y. You don't need to worry about the y for anything. So if we're going down through and taking a look, we can find the z score and start to identify uh, probabilities based on uh, that information. So, I'm assuming a normal distribution. What's the probability of randomly selecting a z score at or greater than z? Sam, what do you think? Yep, uh, equal to or greater than a value. Okay. 
yet. So it's and this is I'm glad you asked that because uh, this is where our where we're coming in. So the question is, I want to know uh, the probability of finding a z score greater than or equal to one to zero to one. But here, I'm saying a score greater than or equal to one. Which part of that distribution is a smaller portion, right? So what's the answer going to be there? All right. People see where Sam got that guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a small reversal. That's fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. So basically, if I were to randomly select someone out of this distribution, what's the likelihood that I'm going to get someone uh, of an observation that corresponds to a z-score greater than one? Well, it's about 15.9%. It's a little under 16%. That I'm likely to just pull a, 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 a score above. Does that mean I can't? No, it will. So that out of 100 draws over time, I feel like I would likely get just about 16 people to fall there. But in general, it's sort of less likely than someone who uh, has a score of less. Right. What about assuming a normal distribution? What's the probability of selecting a z score at or less than 1.5? Emily, what do you think? Five. Yep. Yep, ninety-three percent. How did you use that? Did people see how Emily got that? Again, if we say kind of switching it up, right? Up in the distribution here. So we're going out farther this time. One point five, right? But we're looking less than or equal to. That's all of this, right? So if I go through and I say, okay, yeah, 93%, yeah, that makes some sense, right? Because I'm looking at something below. Yeah. Um, so in doing these problems, if it's greater than zero, like if you're asking about a z-score that's greater than zero, uh -huh. um, okay, never mind. Never mind. No, I was no, going to ask if you can always use like the yeah. larger proportion. Yeah. Okay. And this is where so grabbing it out starts to start to help out. So like right here, assuming a normal distribution, what proportion of the normal distribution is contained below z uh, equal to negative 0.5? Okay, what would be the answer to that? Um. Would it be 30, 20, 80, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And this is what gets a little bit tricky, right? Because we're talking about a z square that falls below. So it's negative 0.5. It's symmetrical, so we can go either way with this, right? So we're still talking, we're talking about the lowest score. In this case, the score is negative, so we're talking about the smaller proportion of the tail. And so we can go through and use that to calculate and uh, capitalizing on uh, uh, the symmetry of, of this distribution. Um, we can also keep playing around with this if we say, for a normal distribution, what score separates the top 10% from the remainder of the distribution? What do you think? I love your answer. Oh, okay. you're, you're exactly right. <laughs> now we've got something a little bit different, so we want to separate the top ten percent. 1.28 is the top 10.03, 1.29 is the top nine. So if you only want the top 10%, then you need to go 1.29. If you're sort of wanting the closest, then you go 1.28. It doesn't really matter, right? Um, but I think to you, you had said, and you should kind of working through this a little bit, you had said, oh, it's probably a really high score. Well, 1.28, 1.29, that's not super high. Okay. So it's you start to see how quickly we start getting 
is a pretty extreme. There's pretty low probability values if we start to work out. But excellent work. Uh, that's exactly what we're going through. Do, do people see how Elizabeth went through with that? What we're looking for is a specific probability and then look at the corresponding z score. Okay. Um, for a normal distribution, when z scores uh, form the boundaries, uh, they separate the middle 60% of the distribution. So, what do you think here? Middle 60%. So, what are the scores that separate that middle 60%? So, I'm looking at the Yeah. Yeah. So, the point of is 29.95%. So, plus or minus, though, right? And that's that's what I was calling for. So, negative point, call it 0.84, negative 0.84, positive 0.84, that captures the center of that distribution. And this is where it's nice uh, in this table where they have you know, this, that starts to become useful and figuring that stuff out. Yeah. Um, so for questions like these, how do you know what you're looking for? Like I, I know how to find it, but I'm just not sure how I know if I'm using the to see larger proportion or smaller proportion. Yep. I understand for this one because it says middle 60%, but why did Elizabeth use the small the smaller proportion for the top 10%? The top 10, right? And Maybe this is where it's always going to go back to. This is why. So I'm looking at the top 10%. Which portion am I going to be looking at? Thing? That top sort of piece of things, right? So if the question is, is what Z score separates the top 10% from the rest of the distribution? If I go through and plot this out and say, okay, it's about, about right here, and this is the piece I'm looking for, if I look at that, but that's then that's going to be the smaller portion of that thing. So I can go through and say, okay. And the smaller portion, I look for 10, and what's Z equals 0.8. Oh, okay. I, I remember what was wrong. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Same thing here. I need to know the middle 60%. Okay. Well, here's the mean. Now, there's a lot of ways I can go through. I can identify subtraction if I wanted to. Right? I could identify the top, bottom 70%, and then sort of go through and subtract it both ways, but it's just they have that in the Z. And so then you'll say, okay, so 30 above, 30 below, it's going to just be plus or minus something. Oh. Okay. Is that? Yeah, so, I've got it. Yeah. Okay, cool. I um, think I got confused because I was thinking like negative would be smaller proportion. Yeah. So I think in my head, I was just. No, no, no. And this is why when you do this, you just plot it out because it's going to make your life a whole lot easier. You're like, oh, I can do this in my head, but then pretty soon you start to get flipped around. I have to be some scratch paper and just kind of draw it out and start to look over So, uh, with our unit normal calculations, pretty straightforward uh, thing. So, we've got a Z. So, we can go to X to Z. We can Z to go from Z to proportions, probabilities. We can't do it directly from X to proportions, probabilities. We need to go through the Z score, right? Um, so, if you're given information, Keeping this in mind, okay, what do I have? Where do I need to go? And then how do I sort of work back uh, uh, through this? Okay. But again, just remembering I can go X to Z, I can go to Z to probability. I can't go directly from raw score to probability without working with that uh, Z score that thing here. Um, we're doing really good in terms of time. Hurry for us. You all are doing fantastic. Okay. So uh, in most cases, what we're going to be doing is like we're going to be uh, interested in the probability of selecting some score that falls at or below some specific x value. Okay. So again, what we're going to have to do is take our x, transform to z. And then we use our unit normal table to go through and find out our associated probabilities. Okay. So, for example, let's say we've got IQ scores from the normal distribution, mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. Uh, what's the probability of randomly selecting an individual with an IQ score less than 130? Okay. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to say, okay, well, I want to get see the score that's less than 130. Right, so I'm going to go through the first calculated z score. So I know mean is 100, standard deviation is 15. So I've got my x is 130, 
minus my mean is 100 divided by 15 is the same deviation, giving a z score of 2. Okay. And then what I'm going to immediately do is, or maybe before this, is go through and do my, do my little drawing and say, okay, z score of 2. What I'm interested in this uh, question is randomly selecting an individual with an ISQ score less than 130. Okay. So, okay, right here, less than, shade in my sort of bigger portion of my, of my table. Uh, or my uh, curve, then go to my unit normal table, identify, like, okay, I'm looking at uh, here, the larger portion of my distribution, I want to go low, and so what I'm going to do then is find probably right here, uh, or find my z-score of two, and so uh, Sam, what's the probability of me randomly selecting someone out in the general public with an IQ score less than one third. About 90 percent, right? And if we know, and again, um, are generally aware of IQ scores, yeah, 130 is really high, right? Well, two standard deviations above the mean, almost certainly we're going to pull somebody who's got a score uh, far and below that, right? So it makes sense with the, within the context of what we know about uh, Intelligence testing, and so everything's kind of scoring up. And I can say, okay, doing pretty good about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Because then we're talking about a different population, right? And so uh, our uh, standard cognitive achievement tests aren't norm for. Do some university professions or college kids and things along those lines, right? So again, this starts to become important in recognizing um, who my measure was normed up on and who I'm interested in looking for, right? Um, and this starts to become an incredibly important piece of evaluating research, knowing whether or not people are doing things correctly, if things make sense, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, yeah, because if someone did this, found a uh, was using these norms and was just working with university undergraduates. Probably wouldn't be that much different, but it's going to trend higher than sort of what this is, right? So I can't use norms for a population that I'm actually not using because things are uh, uh, wonky there. Now, there are actually not that many fields that we use that have good population based norms. Again, the money that goes into Intelligence testing is crazy intense, right? Um, experimental folks is there. There are constructs that have like really, really good population based norms for more respective fields. What's happening? I can't think of anything. There might be. I think maybe there, there might be like personality types. I mean, that's something that's big enough that there might be. So these, these examples that we're working through are kind of specific mainly to very specific domains. It's nice in terms of an didactic to understand how we're trying to uh, work to manipulate some of these types of things. Um, uh, Teresa, to be order and to Emily, so think about like kid-based stuff. There's better at getting like interpretive norms or, or things along those lines, right? So, if uh, like Tara is administering a symptom scale to a child, there's probably norms for like the task or things along those lines as you can tell. Yeah, this person is falling within this. I could pull the measures, like I don't have norms for cash or anything like that, where I can say, oh, okay, it's more in this percentile or whatever, right? So it's cool when we have these types of measures, and if we are using this stuff, it's uh, Certainly, in our best interest to make the most of sort of this norming, but not something that we often run into a lot. So, this is more just for you to get an idea of sort of conceptually of how these distributions work and how we can start to infer probabilities. I think this is going to directly translate over if we're talking about t distributions, graph distributions, or any such other thing. All right. People comfortable with, with this example here? Awesome. Okay. So let's do something a little bit different here. So we're saying, all right, highway department conducted a study of measuring driving speed on a local highway, um, observed speeds 
an average of 59 miles an hour with the standard deviation of 10. I don't know the, where these folks are driving, not in Wyoming. Uh, distribution, distribution of speeds was approximately normal. What proportion of cars are traveling between 55 and 65 miles an hour? So what we might want to do, so a little bit different here. We want to know between 55 and 65 miles an hour. But my mean is 59, right? So we got to do some, uh, some stuff here. But once again, I've got two markers here. I've got 55 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour. First thing I'm going to do is uh, create, transfer those over to these scores, okay? So 55 minus 59 divided by 10 gives me a t-score of negative 0.4. 65 minus 59 divided by 10 gives me a d of 0.6. And then if I draw my little graph up here, um, different than the question Josiah asked, or that I gave to Josiah because I said middle 60 and then you see you just go above or below. This is a little bit different, right? So our lower bound is closer to the mean than our upper bound. So we have to sketch this out and kind of draw our Things and so shade this middle fix this up. Okay, so that's what we're uh, wanting to figure out. Okay. Move along, let me see what I've done up to this point. Then what we're going to do is we're going to pull up our unit normal table. Okay. Say, so, all right, uh, what I need to do is I need to find uh, markers from 0. 0.6 and 0. Uh, 0. 0.4, or it's negative 0. 0.4 uh, and 0. 0.6. What column? Uh, math are we might be useful to use for this problem here. Mean to Z, I like it. Mean to Z is going to be helpful, right? So then what I can then go through, I can go find my uh, mean to Z for a Z score of 0.4. It's negative 0.4, but it's symmetrical, so that's fine. Uh, go down the list, find it for 0.6. And then it's just a simple addition, right? I take uh, from negative 4 to the mean, 1.554 plus uh, 0.6, the mean 0 0.25, uh, 2257, and that gives me 38.1. So I can say 38.1%. So we're going back to my uh, question here. Say, uh, portion of cars traveling between 55 to 65 miles an hour, based on the information I've got, about 38% on that. Right out of there. So uh, what if we then say same information, but now we want to know the portion of cars driving between 65 and 75 miles an hour. Okay. So we've shifted things over. This adds a little bit of a wrinkle, right? but we're going to do the same thing. Okay, 65, I've already got my Z score, score for 65. 65 plus one is Z score of 0.6, so I don't have to redo that. But I've got a new score, 75 miles an hour. So to calculate my Z score for 75 miles an hour, I get a Z score of 1.6. Okay. So I've got my Z score for 0.6 already, right? Uh, but I need a Z score for, oops. And uh, probably what I'm going to do if I'm looking at this, there are a number of ways I can do it. But if I plotted this out, um, what I might do is I say, okay, I want to look at a smaller portion of 0. 0.6. That's if I take 0. 0.6 off into the tail, that's going to get me kind of where I'm going. But then also I'm going to go find go find the, my column of 0. 0.6 right here. And if I also look at the smaller portion of 0. 0.6, that's going to give me this. And now what I've got is a basic subtraction uh, problem, right? So if I go to the smaller portion, so if I go from 0 0.6 out to the tail, uh, from 0 0.6 uh, higher is going to give me 27.43% uh, of uh, distribution is going to be there. But I don't want to go all the way out to infinity. I don't want to go to 1.6. So if I look at 1.6, smaller proportion there, I've got 0 0.0584. Or 0 0.0548, right? If I take that, subtract that, it gives me 22%, just falling right there. Now, there are other ways I could have done this. I could have started at 1.6, look at the larger proportion, and then subtract the larger portion of, uh, from 
from 1.6 over. I can go 1.6 to the mean. So there's a number of different ways I could have arrived at that. It doesn't really matter how you do it. Uh, but just thinking about how do I go through and get to uh, sort of that section of the graph that I'm looking for and then pull that out. We're seeing how we're going through and manipulating this to go through and then play around with stuff over here. Questions? Uh, so just to clarify, because um, I was a little confused at first, but I yeah. think I understand now. So for these, once you find what the Z score is, you look in the table and you find the Z score instead of going to the mean to see and finding like like point four or whatever. Instead yeah. you find the Z score of of yeah. Yep. Yep. So here, yeah, uh, and it just kind of depends. And uh, again, there are a couple of different ways you can, you can do it, right? Uh, but here, what we did is we got our z scores in, and this is where hopefully you see we're plotting this out, so it's become very, very helpful. So you're not trying to do this all. Don't try and be a hero, right? Just go through and, and graph it out. Um, but if we go through, and I can say, okay, it's sort of like a problem. It's like a brain teaser. Like, how do I find sort of this piece of things? Like, well, what I can say is I. I there's no way for me to pull this directly from the table. What I can do is I can say, I know if I start at 0.6 and I can look at step above, I can go smaller portion. And then if I take my other marker, subtract that, what I'm left with is sort of stuff. So there's no way to get this without subtraction. This is a subtraction problem. But if we're kind of looking at it and know where information on the table gives us, And so this is the type of thing if you all are working on problems like this. This is where working with team says you come help with that. I can't so what is going on there. Oh yeah, we can go through and do this, subtract this. That's awesome. Other questions. All right. Uh, let's go through one more set here. This is a little bit different. So we've got SAT scores, uh, form a normal distribution with mean of 500, standard deviation of 100. What's the minimum score necessary uh, to be in the top 15% of the distribution? So what are we looking for in this problem? So an SAT score, I'm looking for a raw score, right? Which means I'm gonna to have to do some gymnastics with my, uh, with my formula, right? So what I'm gonna do, first of all, I'm gonna plot out my thing. Like, all right, I want the top 15% of this distribution. Then I'm gonna pull up my Z score what Basha might have been looking for in my table. Smaller portion. Uh, almost. You mean 0 0.15? Yes. OK, I mean. there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Those are two very different percentages. Yes, uh, right. But yeah, looking at my smaller proportion, and if I go down through, and again, we've got a little bit, if I'm, if I'm wanting sort of to catch the full top 15%, uh, I might uh, choose 1.49, that's very close. And this corresponds to you a Z-score of 1.04. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the raw score that corresponds to a Z-score of 1.04, right? So what I then do is go through and say, okay, well, I know my mean is 500. My standard deviation is 100. So if my, so this is just my sort of long uh, version on the algebra, right? So I know Z was at X minus uh, the mean over the standard deviation. Well, if I multiply both sides by the standard deviation, that gives me uh, mu times, or sigma times Z equals X minus uh, mu. We got this, you add mu to both sides, and this ends up giving me a standard deviation times the plus the mean is going to be equal to my x. Okay. This may be reaching way into the back pocket with like high school algebra stuff. It'll come back as you <laughs> start going through this. It's just basically manipulating this formula. Okay. So what I'm doing essentially is solving for x here. Okay. But once I've gone through and done that, now it's easy, right? My z, my no, so I just told us our z is uh, 1.04. Then I'm just plugging this up. So I know uh, standard deviation is 100, z score is 1.4, plus my mean is 500, gives me a, an SAT score of 604. So what I can do is I can say 
um, that score of 604 on the SAT is the point that chops off the top 15 percent. 15 percent of uh, people who take the SAT will 15 percent of individuals who take the SAT will score 604 and above. We're just kind of working backwards to get stuff. Now yeah, we're kind of manipulating the sort of our our uh, equation to go back to and, and solve for what we want. Uh, so what's the range of values uh, that define the middle 80% of the distribution of scores? What's, what's that center that's getting to that middle 80%? Okay. So same thing, what I'm going to do is I'm first going to plot this out and say, okay, wrap my head around this, what am I looking for? Something symmetrical. So I'm looking for something that cuts off the top 40% or sort of gets from the mean to upward uh, bound of 40 mean below 40. So again, pull up my Z table. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, what are we looking for here? Okay. Okay. So, okay, middle, middle 80%. So, if I take the top 10%, yeah. So, from, yeah, we're speaking the same language. Yes, you could do that, right? So, what you're talking about is looking at a uh, smaller quotient and finding a value that's in the top 10%, right? And the same thing with the bottom. No, 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 you can absolutely do it that, that way. Now, is that going to be a different score? The top, uh, the, the top 10%, the bottom 10%? No, I'm to do that. Exactly, positive multiple, right? And so, if we do that, right, uh, and we go through with a smaller portion of the top, puts off the top 10%, and on the way we want it, just gets a little bit. That's a perfectly valid way. If that's how it should be thinking about things, that's awesome. Other thing you can do just to get this head in the Z, like this would be where my head was going, is from the center to 40, center to 40, other way. But if we do that, we get to what's 40%, the bracket the same place, right? So it doesn't matter. We're still getting at the same value. I would say maybe one point. A little bit more than 10%, so you can do it out the other way, but that only matters if you like really need a hard cut. You know, it's only if you're exceeding uh, the end. So I don't want those one point, uh, two, one point two eight, one point two nine. I don't want those, it's going to be uh, an acceptable at change response. Okay. So we arrived, so we took about a little bit different path, but over it really valid. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. People, people see kind of how this is going back and forth, how we can go both ways with this. All right, so now we've got our Z score, uh, 1.28. We've already gone through and sort of solved our equation here. Now we just plug that into our value. So we've got X is equal to. 100 and 1.28 plus 500, we have a value of uh, score of 628. Uh, 100 multiplied by negative 1.28, that negative is going to be important. That's the bottom, right? Take uh, that plus 500, take 372. Again, this is going to require you to brush up on your algebra and remember that sort of negatives are become important, otherwise, you're going to have the same score, you get a little confused. Uh, but if we do this right, we find that. Some a score of on the SAT of 372 to 628. This captures that middle 80% of scores. It's chopping out the top 10%, the bottom 10%, um, and it's been a big chunk of, of folks that we get from our students. Questions on how we did this? So, why this is all important. Again, have been uh, kind of alluding to this as we've gone through and talked about things. Um, our distributions, corresponding pro uh, probabilities, this is the foundation for our statistics, right? 
right? This is what this is all based on. If we sort of pull back the curtain, like our entire uh, statistical process is based on the assumption that we know the distribution of some statistic estimator. If we don't know the distribution of it, then we start to get worried and we have a hard time uh, getting accurate inference. Okay. Um, at this point, we're just talking talk about the curve, right? Uh, but these same concepts apply to any type of statistic or uh, statistical distribution that we're working with. So T distributions, F distributions, chi square distributions. Okay, if we know what the distribution is and we know what the score uh, is on that distribution, we can say this is the probability of, of randomly selecting a score of this uh, of this uh, magnitude or higher or lower, anything like this. This is what allows us to go through. And run the types of analyses, sort of our classic inferential statistics. Okay. Um, so, go through and do this, and we know how this works, and we have a good solid understanding of kind of what's going on with this. You don't need to know the linear algebra or uh, you know, the complex mathematics on how this is done. We've we'll gone through and figured this out, right? But what I want you all to know is understand exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it all fits together. Uh, so that we can have a stronger understanding of the types of statistics uh, that we throw in this semester. Questions? All right, cool. Let's do this. Let's take a 10 minute break, come back at uh, 3.40, and then we'll jump into confidence intervals. Thank you. This is the fastest side of the world to do with uh, this stuff. People feel they have a good understanding of kind of some of the examples, what we've done. Hopefully a lot of this was, was review. All right, cool. We'll save some time uh, on things. <laughs> I was worried that we were going to move through it too fast, but I think we did okay. Cool. All right. Okay. So, up to this point, what we've done is we've calculated some descriptive statistics and trying to talk about using these descriptive statistics as estimators of our uh, some population parameter. Okay. And remember, the idea is that I'm interested in something, some theoretical value that exists out there in the ether that I can never actually know. It's unknowable. We can't measure it directly. But what we can do is measure it indirectly or get a very good approximation of it using our uh, statistical techniques. Okay. But it's always, always, always important to recognize that this is what we're doing. We've got some fallible observ uh, observable that we're trying to infer something about a much larger thing. Okay. And it's always important to recognize that our point estimates that we sort of calculate from our samples, this is only approximate, only appro an approximation. Okay. It's our best guess. Based on the information that we have available to us at any given time, this is our best guess for what the uh, for what the population parameter is, um, but the likelihood that our point estimator is exactly identical to our population value is functionally zero. We're always going to have sampling error in there, right? And that doesn't mean we've had a bad sample or the other sample is not representative. It just means that we're fallible beings sort of trying to do the best with the information we have at our disposal, okay? So it would be nice if we had some measure uh, of precision, okay? And you're gonna hear me talk about this a lot, uh, talking over and over and over about precision, um, but it would be nice, I would think, for anything that I'm reading to know sort of how fine, this is your best guess, how precise can we assume that this uh, information is, okay? And our solution is interval estimation, okay? Um, what our interval estimates do is they give us uh, an index of the precision of our estimates um, in addition to the range of uh, plausible or likely values for a population parameter based on the data that we have at our disposal and the assumptions of our underlying model. And now I asterisked that based on the assumptions of our underlying model, because if we start grossly violating our assumptions, then, we've, then we start to lose confidence in uh, the estimates that we've got, right? But if we're playing by the rules of the game, and we're doing that to the best of our ability, what we can do with our interval estimates is we can start saying, okay, here's my best guess. 
but sort of what's the level of precision with this? What's the range of values that would be maybe acceptable given the data that I have and the way I've gone through and calculated it? So for example, we see uh, research suggests that uh, people who exercise five hours or more a week live longer uh, than average than the US citizen, okay? Um, but, okay, so fine. I don't need you judging my life, but whatever. Um, how long, but sort of we might wanna know how long individuals who exercise five or more hours a week typically live, right? So fine, if I look through at people who exercise five or more hours a week, compare them against people that don't, and I say, oh, there's a difference, okay, but how much of a difference, right? Because it's like, if it's all like two days, then who the hell cares? Smoke them if you got them, right? But if it's a long amount of time, then sort of maybe, ah, oh, maybe I'll think about getting in better shape, right? But then how precise is that? Like sort of based on what, right? So we start to get a, an issue of magnitude, right? And this will get into when we start doing on our statistical tests. And we talked about this a little bit. Any statistical test that we run is basically asking whether or not something is different than zero. Whether something is different than zero might not be an interesting question to have, right? What we might be more interested in is how much, right? We also see the height, uh, is, let's say height uh, difference between males and females is not zero. What's the magnitude of the actual difference, right? So like, okay, uh, I say that this group and that group is different than one another by how much, right? And what's the precision that we have on that? Uh, all of this starts to become much better answered by our interval estimates as opposed to our t-tests, our p-values that just says, yeah, based on the data that we have, assuming everything, as, as, these data are unlikely assuming with no difference in the population, right? And we'll get into sort of those linguistic gymnastics in a couple uh, lectures. But so confidence intervals are a hard thing for people to kind of wrap their head around and interpret, okay? Um, and I've sort of gone through in my head and sort of thinking about this, this is all in this, is sort of this handout, but let's say that um, you get some land property, right? You buy sort of a lot to build a house on or something like that. And you say, okay, um, and it's exactly a hundred yards, exactly. So this is the length of a football field, hundred percent, right? If we get down into a very precise, um, but you don't have any sophisticated equipment. So all you're gonna do is you're just gonna walk this, okay? So you go through, you say, find on the internet average stride, stride of an average person is about five foot. So you go through and you count off 19 paces and you say, okay, 19 times five. So this is uh, sort of my piece of property I have here. It's about 95 feet. Okay. So Sam, let's see you're doing this. Okay. And you know, say, Sam, how long is your piece of property here? And you say, oh, I sort of stepped it off. It's about 95 feet. Okay. And so if I said, um, how sure are you that it's exactly 95 feet? What would you say? Probably not, super sure. Probably not super sure, but sort of generally about this is what the, the length is going to be, right? Um, and so recognizing that sort of I were to go through and walk it, I might get a slightly different value, right? And so, you know, if I go through and I ask you, hey, you know, so, you know, you say it's 95 feet. Are you sure it's not? Or not feet. I sort of switched estimates here. It's sort of. <laughs> 95 feet is very different than 100 yards. Let's, okay, ignore that, switch that around. So say we're all talking about the same yardage, right? So you said it's 96 yards. What about, like, uh, what about, what about 90, uh, what about 98 yards, right? What about 100 yards? You'd probably be like, okay, you know. But if I keep increasing, eventually we're going to get to a point where you're like, mm, probably not, right? And so if we think about our interval estimates, that's essentially what we're doing. And the same thing in the opposite direction. I'd be like, oh, do you think it'd be 93? Like, oh, maybe. What about 90? You're like, ah, could be, right? But your best guess is still what you stepped off, right? Um, but we recognize that what we've done is we've estimated that with some error, right? And I can start throwing out additional other alternative guesses and you're probably gonna agree with me until we get to a point and then you're like, mm, that doesn't seem plausible. Not based on the data that I have, I don't think that's a reasonable estimate, right? Now, if push comes to shove and I say 98 and you say 96, like, well, 96 is what I stepped off, so that's what I'm going to go with. But 98 for sure is probably a reasonable, uh, a reasonable guess, okay? So again, essentially what you've done here is you've created a confidence interval, or we've created a confidence interval around sort of your step off of this sort of plot of land, right? At some point, we're going to get something that a value that you say probably not, um, going to get a lower value, you say probably not. Does that mean that it couldn't be that? 
no, maybe it, maybe I just miscounted or something along those lines. But based on the information I have, this seems like an unlikely value. Okay, um, and essentially this is what we're doing anytime we run a study, right? Uh, just say, what are you interested in studying again? Um, I'm studying like the okay. so like political groups and what makes change. Okay, so let's say political political affiliations, right? I did. There was a thing on the Times that had a kind of a cool like six part. Like that was kind of cool. So like you said, like you're trying to measure political affiliation within the state of Wyoming or something like that, right? And so you get a big sample, right? Um, and let's say you go over to YSAC and you get a sort of big kind of representative sample and it says X number of individuals identify as independent, X number of individuals percentages as Republicans and X percentages as Democrats, right? Now, those are the best data that you have available to you, right? And so if I ask you what percentage of, the, of uh, uh, residents of Wyoming identify as independent, you can say, well, sort of based on the data we've got, this is our, our best guess, right? But that's not perfect, right? That's an estimate of sort of the true unknowable value out there in the universe. And so we're gonna have some precision, right? And so you're gonna say, if we start to get increasing and increasing and increasing estimates that start to fall farther and away from your uh, estimate, you're gonna say, oh, maybe, maybe, not as likely as what I said, but possibly, eventually we're gonna get to a point where like, no, that's probably not reasonable, right? That's essentially what we're doing with these confidential rules all the time. Remember, it's never about your sample. No one cares about your sample. Your sample is only useful in that it's representing a sort of some population uh, value that you're trying to go through and, and capture. Okay. Um, always also important to recognize anytime we run a study or anytime we create a measurement and we calculate a confidence interval around that measurement, that's just one interval of a million different or of, uh, an infinite number of uh, intervals that could be calculated with replications, okay? So going back, Sam, and you sort of step off your uh, uh, length of your plot of land, you get 96 yards. Someone else who goes, Elizabeth does it, she's gonna get a different value. And Emily does it, she's gonna get a different value. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna get a different value, right? And so hopefully what happens is that all of our values are, or all of our measurements are gonna vary by a little bit, but hopefully they're in the same general vicinity, right? Then maybe Amanda goes through and she steps it off and she says it's 120 yards, right? And so now I don't know what to do with that. I don't know, maybe Amanda just got really tiny steps, right? <laughs> She's counting them all at, at five feet, just like everybody else, right? Um, but we've got one that's kind of hanging out way out there on the edge, right? Now, if we just take yours and we take Amanda's, do we have any idea of whose is better or who's more accurate or who's more likely to be close, right? Your interval's here, her interval's over here. I don't know, right? Information from any given interval tells us very little about anything because we, our point estimates are all going to fall on this and my study, with my estimate, maybe way out there. It's not an impossible value to get, but absent in th any information about how other people who have run this type of study, there's no way to tell whether or not my estimation or my estimate falls here or something that falls right here, right? But if we go through and we have say a hundred people step this off and we're all kind of in that, our point estimates are gonna change and we're gonna have different sort of levels of precision, right? But if we have 100 people do it and 95% of those estimates are falling in that 96 to 97, 100 to 93 to, we're kind of getting a good sense that somewhere around there, that's kind of where we are. Amanda's that says 120, I'm not sure what happened. That was just something to hang out out there on the fringe. And so we're probably not gonna give in context uh, Amanda's uh, measurement much credence. Um, but if Amanda's the only person who set that off, there's way, no way to know sort of where she's at, right? And so this is, if we're going through and thinking about um, these interval estimates, recognizing that yes, based on the data that I have, here's my point estimate. Based on my method of collection, here's sort of the precision, here's the upper and lower bound for what I think that population value could be. But what I don't know is whether or not 
my population value is in that. I don't know where my interval stands relative to anybody else. Amanda in isolation thinks has no reason to believe that her uh, estimate is not just reasonably accurate relative to anybody else. But this is where meta-analysis starts to become important. When we start going through and we look at people have done this again and again and again and again and again, and I find something that's way out of bounds. Now I have to start thinking about what happened. What did I do? Did I get a special uh, sample? Did I have contamination in my study? Did I design this wrong? Or did I just get a weird sample, right? That's gonna happen some, not very often, but it's gonna happen sometimes, right? Sometimes in my uh, uh, sampling of folks walking through Prexies in my effort to sort of determine the true uh, height of UW students, sometimes I'm gonna get an average that's 5'4", right? Which is not gonna happen very often or sometimes I'd say it's like 6'3 or something like that, right? It's not gonna happen very often, and if I have very big samples, it's going to happen very, very rarely, but it could, right? The moral of the story is we just don't know absent replication and sort of uh, aggregate uh, analysis of these data, okay? So people understand kind of the idea be behind interval in estimation, what this means and, and why it starts to become important and how much information that it can start to tell us about things, okay? So... When we're calculating our confidence intervals, uh, this is um, an interval calculated at some assumed level of precision. Uh, all of our intervals are going to contain a point estimate, our level of estimation, okay, and then our interval estimate, sort of our lower bound and our upper bound. Um, so our formal interpretation of confidence intervals, okay, mathematically what uh, our confidence interval is uh, telling us is over an infinite number of replications, the proportion of intervals that are expected to cap uh, capture the, tr uh, the true population value, okay? Thinking about uh, this interpretation as a frequentist approach and it's about the method, right? If I were to replicate this study an infinite number of times, if I've set my level of precision at uh, 95%, I'm saying 95% of all possible intervals that could be calculated with a sample of this size drawn at random from this population, 95% of those intervals will capture the, the true population mean, okay? That means though that 5% of those intervals aren't, right? Now, do I know for any given individual study whether or not my uh, interval is in that 95% or the 5%? I don't know, right? Now, if I had to guess, I'm guessing it's in the 95%, but if you pin me down, I don't know where, I, where I'm at with this, right? And again, it's all sort of assuming that I have a random sample, I haven't violated any of the, under, any of the underlying assumptions of, of my stuff, right? Um, so again, the important thing to remember here, confidence is a property of the method and not the interval, okay? So your individual interval that you pull up has nothing to do with any 5% chance of anything else, right? We're saying that over the long run, if I were to do this for all possible samples that could be drawn from this population, 95% of those intervals based on my procedure will capture sort of the parameter that I'm uh, looking to capture. But for any individual uh, interval, I don't know. I can't tell you one way or the other uh, with any level of confidence, whether it, whether it, uh, captures the population parameter or not, okay? And so this is why it's not correct to say there's a 95% chance that a confidence interval contains the true value of the, uh, of the parameter, okay? From a mathematical standpoint, from a conceptual standpoint, that you're, you're, you're giving a, a, a misleading interpretation of what we've done with this situation, okay? Again, the idea is that our confidence intervals, this is a frequentist approach, okay? Um, if I go through, and in Sam's case, let's so, sort of stepping this off, um, our individual confidence intervals based on our measurement is going to vary widely, right? Again, over, if I were to go through and pull all possible samples of, um, Sam, what do you, what do you study again? Eating pathology. Okay. So let's say if I'm measuring, um, average number of binge eating episodes 
average number of weekly binge eating episodes, monthly, we'll go monthly, monthly binge eating episodes in uh, university students. Okay, something like that, right? At Wyoming, let's sort of bring it down, okay? If I were to go through and randomly select samples of 50 of university students, measure their, uh, the number of binge eating episodes with every single one of those replications, I get a slightly different point estimate and slightly different intervals, right? Now, if I were to go through and calculate and capture all possible samples uh, from this population, I'm gonna get a very, very large number of intervals, right? Um, and sort of based on sort of our method, what we would uh, assume is that some of these, uh, some of these intervals are ca gonna calculate, capture that two, true population parameter, but some of them aren't, some of them are gonna fall outside, okay? And what our confidence, uh, uh, our, what our confidence level does is it tells us of those infinite number of replications, how many, are, how many do we expect to capture, contain the actual population parameter, okay? The problem is if we go through and say, there's a 95% chance that my interval that I've collected contains a population uh, value, it suggests that the, the uh, that population parameter is a variable, right? It says, if I say there's a 95% chance that um, my interval uh, contains a true population value, uh, it says that 95% of the chance, 95% of the time, uh, this value from X to Y is gonna calculate, capture sort of that population parameter. It suggests that the population parameter is a variable. Population parameter isn't a variable, it's a number. It's an unknowable number, but it's just one number, right? So for my individual interval, the likelihood that it captures the population parameter or not is zero, 100. Either it does or it doesn't, right? And so to say there's a 95% chance that it does is a misrepresentation of what we're actually doing with this. My interval, based on my data, this is the best guess. This is my point estimate. This is my best guess for what this population parameter is. Now, I know it's not gonna be accurate, but this is the level of precision. And so based on my interval estimate, I'm saying the data that I have suggests that this and this, these are reasonable values to guess for the population parameter. But at the end of the day, I can't tell you whether or not uh, with any percent certainty, whether or not sort of this interval captures it because either it does or it doesn't, okay? And so what starts to end up happening is that uh, we're trying to take a useful metric, explain it to people. We're trying to take a complicated sort of methodological process that does contain information and explain it to people in a way that they can understand. And in an effort to do that, particularly with a focus on sort of the, the sort of our precision estimate, we start to potentially give people misleading information about what's going on and sort of the likelihood of things and what we're actually doing, right? Um, so again, this is from one of the papers that I assigned you. So coverage probability is a property of a long sequence of confidence intervals computed from valid models rather than the property of any single confidence interval. So over the long term, I can say 95% of the intervals that I calculate that could be calculated using this method will capture my population parameter but any one individual, I don't know, I can't say. If I had to guess, I would say, yeah, but I don't know, right? And this is where we run into our replication crisis where it's experimental folks have really started to sort of be, take steps to try and address this, right? Because for any given individual study, I don't know, sort of, I've got a great effect and I'm really excited about it, but that might be something this went haywire. Not saying I fooled around with data or I did anything wrong, it's just something I went through and I came up double zeros on the roulette wheel, right? Now, if I only do that once with no other information, I'm like, hey, yeah, no, this maybe happens all the time. It's not, it's a very rare occurrence, right? And so this is where replication and understanding what our statistics are saying starts to become important, okay? Um, other thing that's important uh, to recognize is that our confidence interval, this is a best case scenario, okay? Um, if we're starting to think about the validity of our statistics, this is all predicated on the assumption that um, I've got a representative sample uh, and uh, what I've done is consistent with the underlying uh, assumptions of my model. As soon as I start playing soccer, but I'm playing by baseball rules, everything goes out the window, right? And as soon as my samples aren't representative of the people who I wanna to speak to, 
everything goes out the window. This is a best case scenario. And it starts to become very, very important that we recognize that in evaluating literature, statistics, and things along those lines, and recognize that it's uncomfortable. We probably know much less than we think we know or would like to know about certain things. Uh, our statistical models give us this veneer of uh, certainty. When there is no certainty, it's <laughs> not complete anarchy. It's better than nothing. And so we haven't come up with a better alternative yet. Uh, but sort of recognizing sort of the fallibility of our estimates, even when we're doing our best to do stuff. Okay. So do people start to see why we can't just, oh, there's a 95% chance that sort of this to this captures the population parameter. Okay. Technically that's not right because either it does or it doesn't. There's not, it's not a chance thing, right? Uh, the population parameter doesn't sometimes jump in my uh, interval estimate, sometimes jump out. It's in there 95% of the time and then 5% of the time it's not. This interval that I've calculated and captured, it either captures or it doesn't. Now, over the course of an infinite number of replications, 95% of the intervals that could be calculated will uh, span that population parameter. But for my one individual parameter, who's to say? Yeah. So, I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. Mm -hmm. No, okay. no, now you, you know what? I'm not the answer. No, that, no, you're, I'm going to tell you this right now, get 95% out of your brain, get 90% out of your brain, 99% out of your brain. Again, that's sort of lending itself to sort of a unwarranted sort of understanding of sort of what's, what's going on. Okay. Think about this, remembering that our interval estimate is about the method. Okay. It's about if I were to do this over and over and over and over again, doing the exact same thing, 95% of the intervals that I could estimate are gonna capture my population parameter, but five aren't. But I don't know for instance, for with any degree of certainty whether or not sort of my interval does. I think it does, I hope it does. It's my best guess, but I can't tell you with any sort of, with any sort of, sort of percentage that it does. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and then it's it's a day. I mean, the, the method is sound, but we need to be careful in how we're communicating things so, so that uh, people are understanding what's going on. Okay, so conceptual interpretations, formal interpretation, technical interpretation. If we were to say uh, over uh, sort of, uh, if we were to uh, run all possible replications of sample size x, uh, this is what we would find. So x percentage of the intervals would be expected to cover the population parameter, right? That's not super helpful to anybody trying to like understand much of anything and it requires an understanding of the frequentist approach to statistics. So in terms of, and again, um, these are both really outstanding articles, right? Thinking about how do we communicate what's actually happening with these, with these interval estimates, right? Um, we can say, uh, that a confidence interval represents a range of plausible of probable values of our parameter given the available data. Okay, um, we say volume, values that are fall outside of the interval relatively implausible uh, given the data uh, in the underlying model, but not impossible. Right? Um, maybe based on the data that I have, it seems like sort of whatever value you were saying is unlikely because it falls outside, but it's not impossible. What I'm saying is based on the method that I've gone through and done, this is the range of values that are at least reasonable to expect based on the information that I have uh, obtained in this sample, right? So that's good. What about, so another way we could talk about this is uh, observed data are compatible with values uh, of the mean falling within the interval, but relatively incompatible with values falling outside the interval, right? So the data I've uh, collected are compatible with values ranging from X to Y for our population parameter. Anything falling outside is relatively implausible based on the data that I've uh, collected. But, you know, uh, again, what we're saying is, so based on the data that I've collected in the method, estimates falling between this and that uh, are reasonable, okay? Um, values uh, compatible with the data given the underlying model range from sort of my lower to upper. Emily, what am I not saying in any of these? Yeah, no 95% of anything, right? It's important to let people know uh, what 
uh, the precision estimate we've used to calculate things, right? But we can use that in a statistic. We'd say 95 CI and then, and then people know, right? It, it's, I would argue, not a helpful thing to roll into our uh, estimates or our interpretation or conceptual interpretations of what we've got going on. One, because we kind of police what confidence intervals that you use. If I decide I'm just going to start using 60% confidence intervals, that's probably not going to fly. So, you know, you can report your confidence interval, the actual sort of numbers. That's going to cue people in those, and if you've done anything crazy with uh, the level of precision, and we can just focus on uh, conceptual interpretations. Okay. Um, we could also say lower limit provides plausible lower bound estimate of the parameter upper limit. It's a reasonable upper bound based on, again, based on the data that we've collected. Okay. Um, we could say margin of error uh, reflects the largest expected error of estimation based on the data in the underlying model. Again, recognizing that all of these, it's always contextualized based on these data in the underlying model, right? Um, my data could be bogus and my model could be backwards. And if that's the case, then everything goes out the window. But based on what I've done, hopefully I'm not gonna do it if I think my data are garbage and the underlying model is implausible. So this is the best that we've got going on here, okay? Um, <laughs> we can be 95% confidence that our, that our interval includes our mean. That, no, we don't want to do that. I mean, you'll see this, right? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you go through and police people in terms of how they're going and like, don't get in your advisor's grill about sort of their interpretations of anything, right? But for this class, what I want you to do is have a strong understanding of what these statistics mean and what they don't mean and ways in which we communicate statistics that adds to confusion and uh, probably is a hindrance to our science, right? So understanding what these actually mean and communicating these effectively without being misleading starts to become important for trying to advance, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is kind of going back to a point that you made a couple minutes uh -huh. ago, but when you said like the confidence interval is not the method, is that referring to, like, I know what a method is, but is that referring to the measures too, or is it more yep. so like the whole, your the whole thing? Yep, exactly, right? And so this is where it starts to be like, we teach statistics and we teach methods and they're, they're in different classes. Um, some people, there have been a move to try and combine methods and statistics, but then that starts to get overwhelming because you could do it. It would be a sort of a multi-year, multi-sequence type of a thing, right? But recognizing that our numbers are just, our, our numbers are limited by sort of our methods. If our methods are garbage, the numbers are no good. Then there's no reason to even believe anything that's going on in the numbers. It's always tied back into the method. And the method uh, involves sort of how I actually collected the data, but then also sort of the underlying statistical model. If I take this statistical model and apply it to this thing where it shouldn't be applied, then again, I'm playing baseball rules and I'm out on a tennis court and who the hell knows what's going on with that, right? That's what happens when we start to violate our, our assumptions. Yeah, Sam. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. So again, so, and this is what we say, we can be 95% confident that our interval includes, I mean, again, what this, what this implies is that the, the population parameter is a variable. 95% of the time is, let's say, what, what's, what's the lower bound of your confidence interval, Sam? What's the lower bound of your confidence interval? I don't know, say a number. Five, and what's the upper bound? Oh, yikes. <laughs> Let's try and bring it in a little more precision. Let's say let's say five and eight. Okay, how about that? Um, so uh, lower bound of five, upper bound of eight, right? So if I say we're ninety five percent confidence, uh, ninety five percent confident that our interval includes uh, the population parameter, that means that implies that ninety five percent of the time, population parameter is going to fall between five and eight, and five percent of the time it's not going to fall between five and eight that either it does or it doesn't. It's in there or it's not, right? There's no percentage of anything, right? What we can say is that if we wanted to be technically correct and really communicate what's going on with this process, we would say, uh, based on these data, I've uh, structured confidence interval that ranges from uh, five to eight. Now, 
over uh, sort of if we were to take all possible intervals that could be collected from samples of this size from this population, we would expect 95% of the intervals that could be drawn uh, would actually calculate, cal capture the population parameter. But that's a whole mouthful and gets into abstract statistical concepts that probably aren't gonna be meaningful to sort of the parent that you're talking to, right? Um, but if we say, so based on the data that we've collected, uh, we would say that here's our best guess, right? Um, but based on the data that we've collected, anything falling from this range to that range would be sort of acceptable estimates or, uh, of sort of whatever it is that we're trying, to, we're trying to get at. So this is still our best guess. And as we start to get in the same thing in that stepping off uh, uh, analogy, right, as we start to get farther and farther away, I'm starting to get less and less down with whatever your uh, guess is until we hit a point where we say, mm, probably not, right? But still recognizing that this exists on a continuum, right? If your upper bound is 10 or eight, and I say 8.1, like, well, probably not. But is that meaningfully different than, than eight? Probably not. And this is where we start to get in and interpreting our confidence bounds. Like, oh, well, my lower bound didn't touch zero. And so then I have a significant result. Like, okay, well, it also, that interval also suggests that um, a difference of 0.1 could be the actual true difference between sort of group A and group B. And 0.1 is a reasonable estimate given what I've gotten. Is 0.1 something that's meaningful or interesting in terms of the difference? It's not zero. So thinking about what that uh, upper and lower bound means in terms of our interpretation also starts to become important in thinking about how jazzed am I about this study and this finding? Does that help? Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Um, <clears throat> this is from a Cohen paper. Researcher who routinely reports 95% confidence intervals can expect over a lifetime about 95 of those intervals will capture it capture the, pop, the parameter of interest, right? Again, sort of really hitting home that this is a frequency, of, uh, a frequentist approach, Like right? It's not, so our individual parameter tells us nothing about anything really. It's giving us the precision on our guess, but we could have Amanda's guess that's way out of bounds, right? Um, but again, Amanda won't know that unless we start aggregating that and looking sort of how does my, uh, estimate and how do my results compare to everybody else who's gone through and done this. Okay. All right, so strengths of our interval estimation um, <clears throat> gives us a point estimate and also the expected precision, okay? Uh, how accurate are we? So are we sort of very high or very low, right? Um, uh, this, with this approach, we're uh, emphasizing um, how much, right, as opposed to is it equal to zero? With our inferential statistics, with our p-value, with our yes-no decision, that's what we're asking. Is, so based on the data that we've got, is this data likely assuming that there's no difference in these population or no uh, thing? Well, whether or not something is equal to zero is rarely going to be a really interesting question. Our interval estimates start to give us a sense for how much of a difference or how large of, a, of an association is there going to be. Um, <clears throat> this width of our, uh, the width of our interval, this is giving us... Uh, specific information about the precision of our of our estimate, right? Um, if I say, um, hey, uh, Josh, how long is it going to take you on average to turn around student drafts on theses or something like that? I'm like, oh, I don't know, anywhere from two seconds to three years, right? I'm for sure capturing, you know, sort of <laughs> how long it actually takes, but that's not a useful uh, estimate, right? Uh, which is kind of silly, but a lot of the times if we go through and we take a look at the, our studies and our statistics, if we're, and this is why one of the reasons people don't like to pre present confidence intervals, because you start to see how uncertain our data is, right? Like either the difference uh, between sort of my two conditions is either something that's infinitely close to nothing or massive, right? <laughs> that's a lot to be desired sort of in there, right? And it's an uncomfortable conclusion to draw, but starts to become important if, let's say, uh, <clears throat> Matt runs a study, I'm interested in replicating it, and I'm looking at how big sort of a, a, a difference I should expect across these two conditions if I'm trying to replicate his stuff. And it's like, oh, it's anywhere from zero to a, uh, close to zero to a billion. I start to become less 
confident in sort of my ability to go through and capture whatever Matt's done if I actually recognize how precise that is. Right now, Matt's lower bound is on the right side of zero, right? But it might be sort of butted right up against there. And so I might start to become less enthusiastic about the likelihood of me replicating this. Okay. So lots of information, oftentimes uncomfortable information, but important information nonetheless. Um, our interval estimates <clears throat> start to give us more accurate meaning perspective on effects. Okay. Again, how big is an effect? How, uh, how close is that lower bound to some null or near null effect? Right. So yeah, it's not zero, but if we're saying that that lower bound is a reasonable estimate of the population parameter, if that's right up against zero, it starts to make me think about this differently than if all I'm looking at is just the mean difference that we've, we've found in something, okay? Um, <clears throat> and if we start thinking about uh, replicability, it gives us a much, much better uh, sense of the extent to which uh, different studies are starting to replicate over and over again, right? This is a, what we're doing in meta-analyses, just sort of looking over and over again. So what's the point estimate? What's those intervals? <clears throat> Our significant tests, these are terrible, 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 terrible for identifying replication. If our uh, measure of replication is whether or not someone has found a significant effect or not, and starting to classify um, studies, whether or not they have or haven't found a significant effect, we're gonna get way misleading on things. Okay, because maybe Katie found something and her confidence interval just kicks over on the right side of zero so she could publish and claim that she has a significant effect, right? Basha, yours didn't, right? It just barely clips the opposite side of zero. Um, even though you found essentially the exact same thing that Katie found, and I would say you 100% replicated her stuff, you got a less than 0.05, yours 0.049, and yours is... 0.052, and we treat those as if they're completely different, right? We've completely missed the boat on that. In terms of estimation, you've got almost complete overlap, right? Yours just happened to fall on one side of an arbitrary cut point, whereas yours didn't. And so we say that you failed to replicate her effects when in fact you didn't, it probably would be difficult to get much closer. It's just yours just kicked on the wrong side of, of that zero mark. Right. So again, <clears throat> using these interval estimates starts to be a much better approach to assessing sort of comparability across studies, as opposed to just whether or not someone uh, failed or, or uh, rejected or failed to reject the null. So uh, inclusion of confidence intervals is from Wilkinson, uh, extremely effective way of reporting results. Confidence intervals combine information about location and precision. They are in general, the best reporting strategy, okay? But they're not because you have to think about them a little bit more. It's not a, just an easy yes, no decision. And it often gives us information that is uncomfortable that we don't like to have out there. But if people know what they're doing and interpreting correctly, they should appreciate the fact that we're being honest in terms of the precision of our estimates and helping us understand better um, what uh, the types of phenomena we're trying to uh, interested in exploring. Okay. Um, <clears throat> other things, uh, thinking about uh, conceptual practical input implications of lower up and bound estimates. Um, plausible lower bound estimate uh, is very near some practical null value. How excited are we about the, yeah, it's not zero, but if uh, the lower bound estimate, if we say that lower bound estimate is a reasonable uh, number for the population parameter, if it's very close to zero or something, right, then we start to become less excited about uh, sort of the day that we have which is disappointing, but I think sort of better to know than to pretend that we've got something that's big and gonna replicate when in fact it might not. Um, if we've got an interval that's very wide, uh, uh, simultaneously indicating support for a very large effect and a near null effect, right? Again, that's my, oh, it's somewhere between five minutes and uh, uh, you know three years, right? Cool, I don't know what that tells me about so if that gives me any real information about the likely time it takes me to turn around a, a, a student thesis, right? Um, so it starts to give us information that we're able to use a little bit more efficiently with things. Uh, but again, also remembering that uh, our estimates are only as good as our model uh, and our data and our methods. Um, expressions of uncertainty are themselves uncertain um, <laughs> in that sort of these estimates are gonna jump around a great deal um, strength of evidence can't be as, uh, assessed absent a critical value of the corresponding methods, right? I can't just look at 
sort of the numbers that someone had and make a determination on whether or not they uh, have found something interesting or not without going through and taking a look at the methods, right? This is a hard thing for new graduate students, I feel like, because back, oh boy, this study was published. And so that much mean it's, it's good and rigorous. That's not the case. Plenty of garbage gets published all the time, right? Uh, when you're going through and looking at things, you want to go through and take a look. So what did they do? Is what they did a reasonable solution or strategy for measuring what they're trying to measure? Are their measures good? Is their procedure good? What's their sampling? All this stuff starts to uh, lend itself into um, <clears throat> whether or not we should put any credence in the numbers. Again, those numbers give kind of a veneer of precision that's generally not warranted, okay? Um, also, uh, important not to place too much uh, emphasis on the boundaries of a particular parameter. Um, again, as we talked about, those parameter bound, those boundaries are going to jump from study to study. They're always going to be a little bit different. Hopefully, if we've got good methods and uh, large samples, they're going to be pretty precise and pretty stable, but they're going to jump around some. And so if, you know, we're talking about, uh, again, going back to Sam's interval, uh, do I really care about the difference between 8 and 8.1? Probably not. You know, one's technically outside the bound, the other is maybe inside, but functionally, those are the same values, right? And sort of recognizing this. All right. So, <laughs> you know, watching you and your interpretations, your confidence intervals, uh, and sort of wanting you to think carefully about these and, and sort of thinking about what they mean. Um, yeah, I was, <laughs> I was I was trying to find a, a photo of police in a sting uniform, and I couldn't find one, and I complained about it in class. And then Chris Mancuso found one like three seconds. Well, you should have been paying attention to what I was talking about, not searching for videos of, of sting in a police uniform, but he found it, and I didn't, so he has access to the dark web or something like that. But, okay. Questions about interpretations of confidence intervals, what we're doing with this, and how we're sort of tying this all together. Okay, you're gonna be doing a lot of uh, 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 interpretations of confidence intervals. Go back to that slide where I have different sort of ways of talking about it. What you don't wanna do is just have your standard stock phrase because then I don't know that you actually know what you're doing or you're just parroting something that you've been sort of plugging and playing. Sometimes that's fine, uh, but to the greatest extent that you can, sort of try and think about sort of different ways of communicating this information, sort of trying to change it around one, It'll help me know that you know what you're talking about. Two, it'll help you really solidify and say, like, if I can talk about sort of something in seven different ways and describe it in seven different ways as opposed to just the same way over and over and over again, it lends itself to understanding things at a, at a deeper level. Okay. So calculation of our confidence intervals. Uh, three pieces of information. If we're talking about confidence intervals around the mean, we've got our standard mean, our sample mean, uh, standard error, and then a Z value or a T value, depending on sort of what we're doing. We'll, work with Z values for right now, okay? So our standard error, all right? In general, the best answer to any question uh, in this class is probably gonna be standard error. Um, <laughs> our standard error tells us uh, how much difference or error we're expected from one replication sample to the next, okay? Our standard error, we'll get into more technical uh, um, interpretations later on, but literally what it's saying, here is my best guess for the average height of UW students. My standard error is gonna tell me if I were to uh, run replication samples with the same number of people and the same method, how much do I expect this to jump around? From sample to sample, how much uh, do I expect this to move around? That's gonna be my standard error, okay? Standard error, pretty straightforward to calculate. Uh, this is gonna be uh, my standard deviation over the square root of my sample size, okay? Uh, pretty straightforward, but again, this is telling me it's giving me an index of how, how precise uh, my estimate is of the actual population mean. Okay. Um, oh, who haven't I picked on for a while? Matt, um, looking at this equation, what are my primary influences on, on standard error? Sample size. Yeah, why is that? Because it's used to calculate both the standard deviation and the standard, uh, standard error. Yeah. What happens is my sample size starts to increase. What does that, what happens to my standard error? Yeah, right. As my sample starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger, my standard error gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that what happens if my standard error is smaller, what does that tell me about the precision of my estimate? 
So if my standard error is my standard error gets lower and lower and lower, my sample size goes up, my standard error gets lower, what does that tell me about the precision of my estimate? Yeah, so the standard error gets smaller, my estimate is more precise, right? Um, if I'm saying uh, from sample to sample, my estimate of the mean uh, of the average height across uh, sort of uh, replication samples, if my standard error is one inch, and it's saying, so on average, I would expect mean height to jump around about an inch, right? That's actually not super precise, right? If I have a standard error of, if I'm measuring it in inches, my standard error is point one. that means a 10th of an inch. That's a much more precise, on average, I'm expecting to get, so it's suggesting a much larger sample, right? So my uh, standard deviation goes into calculating my uh, standard error, but really, if I want to drive down standard error, if I want to increase the precision of my estimates, it's generally going to be a sample size issue. All right. Um, standard error, essential to calculate statistics. You're going to need to know what standard error is. You're going to need to know what standard error is on a conceptual level. Um, any inferential statistics we're going to be working with all are going to involve standard error. So really, really want you to understand what this is, what it means, the things that influence it, and how it impacts our statistics. Basically, our standard error is going to go in the denominator of all mean-based statistics. If that denominator value is smaller, what happens to my uh, test statistic? Uh, um, Teresa, this is me forgetting your name. Okay, got it. Ha <laughs> ha. Teresa, what is that? What happens if my standard error starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller? What does it do if that's in the denominator of my test statistic? What happens to my test statistic? It's getting bigger and bigger. And do I am I more likely to find effects that I'm interested in finding with a bigger test statistic or a smaller test statistic? Yeah, right. If it's like a T statistic. statistic you want bigger, like T values. You want my T values to be sort of bigger. Think about Z values too, right? So again, thinking about my sample size and thinking about power is what happens. I get bigger samples, drives my standard error down. My standard error goes down, my test statistics go up, and so it becomes easier and easier to find some of those differences that I'm looking for, okay? So we'll get into uh, um, more nuanced interpretations of standard error, but just kind of as a preview, this is kind of what this is looking at. All right, so uh, formula for my uh, confidence interval for 95% confidence interval equals mean plus or minus my Z statistics multiplied by my standard error. Uh, my Z value, this just corresponds to my chosen level of uh, precision. 90% um, interval, this is a Z value 1.65. 95% interval 1.96, 99, 2.58. These are always gonna be the same, right? Um, and we're just going to dump those in for Z, and I got my standard error. When we get to T statistics, these will change around a little bit, but for what we're doing now, all it is is pretty straightforward. Mean, Z, and my standard error. All right, so let's think about this. So we've got a former librarian, a local library, claimed that on average, books in the library are 20 years old, okay? New librarian comes in, all right? This is the young guy or woman, right, coming in, you know, shake things up. And what they're interested in is in re-estimating the age of books in the library. I'm not sure. Maybe they have too much time on their hands. I don't know, but this is what they're doing, okay? Um, uh, person randomly selects 150 books, records the publication date, uh, mean age of the books in the sample, 23.8 years, with a variance of 67.5, okay? And so what we want to do with this, we want to calculate the point estimate for the true age of books. I'm going to calculate a 95% confidence interval, confidence interval books in the library and then provide an, uh, an interpretation of that interval. Okay. So first off, um, hey, Basha, calculate a point estimate for the true age of books in the library based on the information provided. What's our point estimate for the true age of the books in the library? What's our best guess? 23.8, absolutely right. What about 20? Why isn't 20 our best guess? What's that? Okay, but the old librarian said 20 years. 
that's based on conjecture and not on any data, right? So I don't know, maybe, but based on the uh, random sample of books, and I've got 150 books, that's a good number of books, right? I randomly pulled 150 books, and I found that the age is 23.8 based on that, okay? So uh, calculate a point estimate for the true age. Our best guess for the point estimate is always going to be our mean, right? For these assuming sort of normal, uh, normal curve on stuff, which uh, we can assume here, right? But what we now want to do is calculate a, a confidence interval for these books, okay? So this, again, for this problem, we've got our mean, our variance, uh, and our sample size. Point estimate for the average age of books uh, in the library is 23.8 years, okay? Um, now, what I've gotten is variance. Can I use variance to calculate my confidence interval? Technically, I could, but as the equation that we're using is calling for standard deviation. So what we're going to do is start by grabbing our standard deviation from our variance. That's easy. Right? We know that uh, standard deviation is just, uh, if we take the square root of the variance, it's going to give us our standard deviation. So take the standard deviation, or the square root of 67.5, gives us a standard deviation of 8.216, okay? So then we just plug things in, right? We've got 23.8, that's our uh, uh, mean, plus or minus 1.96. Uh, Katie, where did we get 1.96? Um, I was paying attention, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well. I got distracted because I was looking for this and I think you put the wrong picture on our Yeah. Yeah, it's like a different thing. Okay, sorry about that. No, it's okay. I will give you, no, that is a confusing thing. And that's, what's that? Is it a z-score? Yes, it is a z-score. Oh. Yeah, uh, corresponding to my level of precision, right? So I've got a 95% confidence interval. 95% confidence interval, if I'm using z, is 1.96, okay? And then here we've got my standard error. Oops, we forgot to do this. So we've got our uh, standard deviation here. Dropping down, calculate our standard error. This is going to be our standard deviation over the square root of our sample size, which is 150. Gives me a standard error of 0.671. Okay. So literally what this standard error says is that if I were to go through, if I were this librarian, and I were to pull all possible samples of 150 from this library of books and calculate the mean of each one of those samples, I would expect on average my point estimate of the mean to jump around by... Uh, 0.67, right? That's what I would expect, okay? So if I take my standard error, plug that into my uh, equation here, I get a confidence bound from 22.5 to 25.1. And down here, my margin of error, this is just my z-score multiplied by my standard error. This says I can also represent this as 23.8 years plus or minus 1.32. That's my margin of error, okay? So how do we interpret this, right? Number of different ways we could go through and do this. We could say, based on, the, based on data collected from the sample, plausible values for the average age of books in the library range from 22.5 to 25.1 years. Okay. So my best guess is 23.8, but if you guess anywhere from 22.5 to 25.1, my data would support that. My data would say those are acceptable guesses. Not the best guess. My be best guess is still 23.8, but based on the interval that I've uh, collected, these are, uh, would be reasonable uh, guesses. Uh, maybe I say data support a lower bound estimate of 22.5 years for the average age of books with an upper limit of 25.1. Uh, results indicate a point estimate 23.8 years for the average age of books in the library with an expected uh, error of estimation plus or minus 1.3 years, okay? In any of that, did I ever say, talk about percentage confidence in anything? Nope you don't need to. This is perfectly fine. This gives you accurate information about what we're really doing without sort of screwing around with trying to talk about 95% confident about anything because it's misleading and technically not correct, right? So what we're wanting to do with this is use our interval estimation to provide meaningful information to people that's accurate, that helps them understand kind of what we're doing. Questions about sort of how we went through and did this? Yeah. Well, I have a question about standard errors. Like, we talked about how that well, it's sort of like standard. We could talk about, so we could interpret that standard error as across uh, sort of all possible replications. 
the average uh, the average distance from the two uh, the average uh, difference from the actual population parameter. Uh, we could also talk about it as the uh, expected difference between any two individual samples, right? So same thing with standard deviation. There's multiple ways to think about it. So just but knowing that and sort of being able to do that correctly or uh, 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 flexibly starts to help. Yeah. So I would say on average, any sample based on the, the uh, stuff that I've got, I'm saying based on this, I'm expecting about sort of the, any estimate to deviate from the actual population parameter by about two thirds of a point, right? Or any two randomly selected uh, samples from all possible replications to difference devi uh, deviate from one another from about two thirds of a, of a point or two thirds of a year, right? Um, something off like eight months essentially with that. Yeah, Josiah. Does this assume Yeah, so we're assuming the average age of books in the library uh, fall on a normal distribution. Probably the road library is bad at something, right? Probably, right? And so excellent, excellent sort of, sort of thinking carefully about this, right? Because this all assumes a normal distribution. And if the thing, the population that we're looking at doesn't fall on a normal distribution, then we've got a different distribution than a normal distribution that may not be symmetrical. And so things start to get a little bit wonky with this, right? So um, the good news is, is we start to run into like our inferential statistics. We're talking about the distribution of sample means as opposed to the actual sort of distribution. And so we, that's how we circumnavigate that, but you're absolutely right because this is based on sort of a, an assumption of, of normal distribution. And if those books aren't, then that starts to play around with this. No, that's an excellent, yeah, that's really smart. Um, but yes, you're correct with that. All right, uh, general conclusions that we might draw from this. We might say uh, that the estimate for the average age of books in library is very precise. We've got the margin of error plus or minus 1.3 years. So, I mean, that's not bad, right? I'm saying with this, I'm, like, I'm expecting, assuming sort of the underlying assumptions are correct, that uh, my estimate with this is within 1.3 years, assuming it's a representative sample and normal distribution, right? Now, if those aren't, neither one of those are true, then that starts to throw out so sort of the interpretations I can make, but that's kind of what we're working with. Um, we could say that the former librarian's estimate of the average age of books does not appear plausible given the data collected in this sample, right? Uh, results suggest the former librarian's initial guess at minimum underestimates average uh, by about two and a half years, right? So old librarian uh, was lowballing sort of how old these books are. Um, Teresa, why, why do I say uh, that their estimate is not plausible? Yeah, yeah. My lower bound, like at minimum, I'm saying that 22 and a half years is, is, the, is the lower bound. They're saying 20. Is that saying that it couldn't be 20? I'm not saying it couldn't be 20. This estimate I got might just be big. I just might have on on accident or just by chance happened to collect a bunch of older books that pulled me higher. But based on the data that I've collected, it seems like that's not a reasonable estimate, right? Um, okay. So questions on sort of how we took this interval estimate and started to sort of pull some sort of more meaningful and nuanced uh, inferences about sort of the age of the book. Okay. Um, let's go for another one. Researcher interested in Flynn effect. What's the Flynn effect? Anybody know what the Flynn effect is? So based on our testing, it seems we're getting smarter and smarter and smarter on IQ tests, which is why we constantly have to renorm these things so that the mean is zero, or excuse me, the mean is 100. If I were to take, if we were to take uh, exams or assessments normed in like the 80s, we would expect the mean of people taking it today not to be 100, it would be sort of creeping up higher, okay? And so what we're interested in is this is what we're doing uh, as we take a test developed in 1980, have a random sample of 100 people tested, uh, scores had a mean of 107 with the standard deviation of 12. Uh, population mean in 1980 was 100, okay? So we're seeing evidence of this flow effect. We've taken an old exam, administered it, scored it, 
given according to the norms in 1980, and what we're finding is a score of 107, which is not 100, which is creeping up, which is consistent with this idea of Flynn effect. So again, what we're going to do, calculate a point estimate, 99% confidence interval this time, uh, and then interpretation of, of that confidence interval. Okay. Emily, what's my best uh, 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 estimate for the uh, current population mean on the old test? 107, perfect, right? Um, and again, point estimate is just the mean, right? Based on the data that we've collected, uh, we've got 120 people, sort of a decent size sample for the types of stuff that we get, and that's a lot of uh, evaluations or assessments to administer, so kind of impressive, right? Um, but what we're uh, going to go through and do then is calculate my standard error. Got my uh, standard deviation divided the square root of my sample size gives me my standard error, 1.095. That means that if I were to <coughs> run an infinite number of replications with samples of 120, I would expect each one of those mean, uh, my mean to jump around by about one point, which starts to look pretty good. Um, I would expect sort of. A, any two randomly selected scores based on uh, replication samples that differ by about one point, which starts to become pretty precise given uh, sort of what we're studying here. Plug this in, calculate my confidence interval. I get a lower bound of 104.2 to 109.8. My margin of error here is plus or minus 2.83. Okay. So again, if I'm going to go through and give interpretations, I could say based on the available data, plausible values average uh, for the average score in the 1980 exam and members of the current population range from 104.2 to 109.8, assuming a normal distribution of scores, right? Um, data collected in the study suggests average scores in 1980 exam fall below, falling below 104.2 or above 109.8, not compatible with estimates of performance in the current, current population. You see what I'm, I'm just trying to like here give you different, like different ways of talking about this, all equally valid, but just kind of sort of changing it around a little bit. So it's not the same thing over and over. Um, results suggest an average score of 107 uh, on the 1980s exam in the current population of adults with estimates ex indicating expected uh, error estimation plus or minus 2.8. Okay. Uh, estimates of performance uh, compatible with these data range from 104.2 to 109.8, assuming, assuming a normal, norm, normal distribution of scores. So again, saying the same thing, just in different ways, what you want to do uh, when we're going through and doing this is thinking about phrasing this interpretation in a way that best communicates or emphasizes sort of whatever it is that you're wanting to, sort of conclusion you're wanting to draw from this. Okay? So general conclusions here, um, average performance on the old test, uh, uh, fairly precise, given a margin of error, plus or minus 2.8 points, right? Um, assuming a representative sample and normal distribution of the largest population of adults, right? So what I can go through and say is like, hey, what you've done sort of based on the methods is you've done something that's pretty precise, right? Sort of a plus or minus uh, just under three points on uh, one of these evaluations is going to be pretty good, right? Uh, results appear consistent with uh, with those expected for the hypothesized Flynn effect, although investors should imp consider the impact of possible deviation of only 4.2 points above the expected mean of 100. What of what am I trying to get at here, Amanda? What am, what am I what am I focusing on in that second conclusion? Yeah, maybe, maybe, I don't know. And this is where we have to start thinking carefully about what that lower bound means, right? So my best guess is that this Flynn effect is consistent with about seven point increase in scores in today's population relative to 1980, right? And for this type of stuff, that's pretty sizable, right? I mean, that's close to half a standard deviation. That's a pretty sizable thing, but, Remember that that point estimate uh, of 107 that's, uh, was measured with, with some level of imprecision, right? So to my confidence bound says, if you said, hey, you know, 104.2 is the actual uh, population score of today's performance on this 1980s exam, I would say, 
Data is supported, it's not my favorite, but it's supported by the data, right? What I might then say, so, like, so well, what if it is 104.2? Well, then that's saying that there's not a seven point difference, there's only maybe about a four point difference. Is that four point difference something we need to get excited about? Probably in this case, yeah, given sort of how much effort goes into the norming of, of these types of things. Um, so recognizing that, yeah, maybe we have a, an effect that is a seven point difference, but our data would support if you were to say, hey, what if this is only like four and a half point difference? I'm big. Data suggests that's plausible, not our best guess, but it's still sort of possible, right? On the other hand, our upper uh, uh, bound of our interval says up to about 10 points, and that's gonna be really big, right? So just thinking about the practical implications of those upper and lower bounds. All right, some additional interpretation in terms of our age of the books, right? Uh, just thinking about remembering, and I've kind of emphasized this, here's our point estimate, here's our bounds. But if we think about this, as we start to get closer and closer to those bounds, the likelihood of, the, uh, of that being a, a, a good uh, estimate starts to get lower and lower, right? So again, our point estimate is always our best guess. As we start to get farther and farther away from it, we get sort of less and less happy about sort of that. Our confidence bound gives us our sort of necessary, necessary boundaries between what we're gonna say our data supported estimates and what aren't. But that's not saying that all estimates within that interval are equally likely, right? As we start to get farther and farther out, it starts to get sort of little, less and less likely, right? So recognizing that. Same thing with the IQ scores. If we can go through and say, yeah, here's the, the bounds of our interval, right? But our best guess is always going to be right here at our calculated mean. Anything in the interval, we're going to accept as a possibility, but that possibility gets lower and lower as we start to get out towards the edges. Okay. One last question, uh, one last uh, example here. What we're going to do is we're going to play with a couple of different intervals and sort of looking at this. Okay, so we've got. This chemical found in protein-rich food could improve memory, okay? We got 10 new to one rats given a normal diet containing uh, less than uh, with seven rats, oops. In a separate sample uh, given diet with none, both samples given memory tests in adults. This is sort of rat memory tests, so it's very precise. Uh, less, the uh, less than sample data, uh, mean 25, variance 61, uh, no uh, less than sample, 33, variance 36.5, performance on memory assessment assumed to follow normal distribution in this strain of rat, scores that deviate by seven or more points are interpreted as having practical significance based on prior psychometric research, okay? So now what we're doing here is we're adding in a wrinkle where it's not just like, is it zero, right? If we're not seeing anything above seven points, then it's probably not meaningful or not worth thinking about or spending too much time with, right? So what we're gonna do is calculate a point estimate for each sample, 95% confidence in overall for each sample and then uh, some interpretations, right? So again, we've got our control sample uh, uh, where we've got uh, our, um, our control mean, uh, our best guess is a memory score of 25, uh, no less than score uh, of 33, right? So we've got, we're thinking less than should improve memory. 10 new more to control rats are sort of rats that are, have this sort of compound in their food, but no less than cut it all out, right? And so we see the control sample or has a mean of 25 on our memory test are no less than uh, uh, 33. Calculate confidence interval for or standard error for our control group. Um, here we're uh, standard error. I just kind of fooled around with this. Uh, the formula is uh, standard deviation over the square root of your sample size. We just took the variance over the sample size and took the square root of the whole thing. It's functionally the same thing. So we've got our standard error here, standard error here, calculate on confidence bounds here. And so here we get for our control group, this is the group of rats that have less than in their diet, uh, 20.16 to 29.84. Uh, for our no less than group, we've got a, a lower bound of 28.53, 37.47, okay? 
So uh, population estimates for the average memory score of rash receiving standard dietary, dietary less than range from this to this, point estimate of here, same thing um, with that, right? So again, we're just giving some uh, interpretations of what's going on with these two intervals, okay? Now, thinking about what we're trying to do in our hypothesis, is there anything that strikes anybody as strange about these data? Yeah, Emily. What's that? Sure, okay, so we've got a between groups uh, approach as opposed to within, within groups and still approach. But if we've got, these are sort of a pure strain of rat breed and we've got sort of our control group is our group that just gets like straight up sort of diets or regular with less than in it and things like that. We can assume that these, these folks are probably about representative of what we would expect for in, the, in these rats. But, but I like where your head's at with stuff. Yeah. What's that? Okay, so we've got overlapping confidence bounds. Okay. What about that point estimate, Josiah? Well, I mean, I guess we don't really, it doesn't tell us what the expected number is. Right. Because it's really hard to tell what the expected number is. But it is interesting as a sample split the typical is lower. Bingo. All right. What we've got is we've said that, hey, these rats, this less than thing, it helps improve memory. And so what we've done is we've had rats that have less than normal stuff. And then we took rats without it, right? What we ended up finding is essentially the opposite of what we were expecting. It's the rats that are, didn't get less than in their diet are performing higher on the memory test than the rats that had it, which starts to become, and this is a thing that happens all the time. People just start to like, oh, there's a difference without taking a step back and saying, is this a difference in the direction that I would expect? We're getting something that's different but it's in the opposite direction, what we would hope. And so now we've got some, some stuff to think about, right? So thinking about uh, general conclusions based on what we can, what we can say, precision in these estimates, if you will, right? Based on what our uh, confidence bounds. And again, we've got uh, samples of 10 and seven. This is garbage in terms of precision, right? Our mean is still the best guess that we have, but we've got really uh, wide confidence bounds. Uh, for both of these, okay? Um, Although point estimates of uh, memory scores uh, fall outside the confidence bounds of the opposing groups, there's overlap in the upper and lower limits, okay? So this point estimate for our controls of uh, 25 all below the value, I might know less of the group, so if I said, well, what if it's 25? Like, maybe, but not based on these data, it doesn't seem likely. Same thing, 33 falls outside the value for this, right? Um, but what we have to remember is that both of these estimates, 25 and 33, are themselves met, uh, measured with precision, right? And so just because the point estimate of one doesn't fall within the confidence bounds of another isn't a slam dunk, we would need to go through and look at the, at the overlap in those confidence bounds, which is where uh, that coming of bitch uh, paper that I have uh, gave you all to read starts to become really smart and thinking about confidence bounds and how to interpret them and, and sort of manipulate these, okay? say that results are compatible with differences in population estimates ranging from uh, 1.3 points higher in memory for the less than similar restricted rats to 17.3 points higher uh, for rats with normal levels of dietary left. Okay, this is if we go through and take sort of confidence bounds. Is less than right? So we've got anywhere from this amount for a less than, right? Our confidence bounds to our upper bound estimate for our less than group minus our lower bound for this gives us maybe this much possible for greater uh, memory scores in my less than versus uh, sort of this. Oops, no. Lower bound and upper bound here plus control, right? So we've got anywhere from sort of a small advantage for left that's into a massive uh, 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 benefit for control based on sort of our upper and lower bounds. Yeah. But even if you get smaller, if you call it that, well, the, the, the first one would be bigger. Because that's the better one. 
Okay. Yeah. 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 And so that's so we're we're getting there. Hold on to this real quick. Yeah. Yep. And so this is where you get into that coming of pitch paper where it starts to talk about you're hoping to have reasonably equal samples with uh, some of this stuff. Here we've got a difference of three, so we're probably not too worried about that. Although a difference in three starts to make a lot more of a of an impact when we're working with samples of this size versus a three point difference from 150 and 153, right? So yep, want to think about that in terms of, of precision, but based on the data that we've got, it could be anywhere from sort of this much this way to sort of this much the other way, depending on how we're looking at things, right? So we're saying uh, um, it is support the possibility of no meaningful difference in the population, as well as the population of considerable deficits in uh, less, less than restricted uh, or Nope, that's not sort of benefits of performance in less than restricted rats or what? Oh, have that turned around. Anyway, important to note, I need to go back to and read that. No, we're sort of running low on time. Uh, important to note that difference is in the opposite direction of what we had expected here, right? And so while intriguing additional data needed to address potential relation between less than memory performance, close examination of methods is also going to be warranted here, right? So yeah. So we're I think I said that higher scores are associated with, with better memory. So, so with, uh, with, uh, sort of this piece of things here, right? What we're doing is we are um, going through and trying to take this information that we have uh, with these intervals and trying to sort of extract the most information out of this. And so giving examples here about how we might go through and start to sort of think about what can we learn, what can we extract from the information provided. Guidelines for uh, comparing the uh, conference intervals. This is a coming in Fitch uh, paper thing she'll go through. Take a look at that. It's really amazing paper. Um, hopefully you have enough information now to go through and sort of have a good uh, sense for what's going on with that. But if you have questions, come through and let me know. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, folks. Um, questions as you're sort of packing up and all oh, right there. Look at that. Boom. <laughs>